Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Friday night and you know what that means. I've not said that in about three or four weeks now because, yes, Bustalgia is back after a little bit of a brief break because, let's face it, none of you people wanted to hear about old seasons and what was going on at the club at the moment, but here we are tonight. The Bustalgia bus is back out of the garage and we are taking a little time travelling in the archives for this very specific reason. Why wouldn't we, of course, tonight is in focus and it is all about Brendan Rogers. Of course, we've been talking about him for the last two weeks solid. But tonight, we'll have a little retrospective look at Brendan. We'll go back to, uh, obviously, his first spell as Celtic manager. We'll reminisce about some of the great moments. Of course, we have done all of the seasons that Brendan was in charge in more depth in other episodes of Bustalgia. Tonight, though, it'll be more a wee career retrospective looking at Brendan before he joined Celtic, talking about some of his moments there. And obviously, what happened between 2016 and 2019. And as you can see, tonight... A very interesting time traveling team, obviously, to my uh, side here. Liam Greenlaw, I've not seen you in weeks, mate. Literally, we've not been on the same show in about a month, mate. I think it was a Scottish Cup episode, was the last time. How are you doing anyway? The wise man of the bus, Canada's yeah. favorite, Tim. It's good to see you, mate. Good to see you too, you as well, Phil. Felt like I'd lost my bus pass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming this week. No, I'll come. I just needed to get the schedules right and. Uh... My God, it's been it's been good listening to all this other stuff going on. The last time I was on Phil was really about the Scottish Cup. Aye. You know, Aye. I spoke if you're a play man, you've been getting up at like five in the morning to do those uh, power hours with Steve and stuff over the last couple of weeks. So fair play to you, mate. Oh, that was good. I enjoyed that because I like getting up early. But uh, that was half five. I was on with Steve, and I uh, but my my tongue was trying, still trying to find its way around my face. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, good to be back. <laughs> To see you. Ah, good stuff in a more sense for you tonight. And of course, those who are uh, where well trained eye might spot something down below me here. It's not <laughs> Russell Boyce who normally joins a Friday night for the first time in nearly a year. We've got the judge, Mark Kearney, on Bustalgia. <laughs> yes, Brendan Rogers has brought him on to Bustalgia tonight. Mark, it's great to see you on a Friday night, mate. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, mate. Thanks for asking me on. I can't resist going on and uh, talking about Brendan Rogers. I'm really delighted about the news and it's good to be back on the pod with Liam. He's a guy that I love listening to. And it's always it's good you mentioned the fact that five in the morning that guy gets up to come on the pod before he even starts his work. And that's, it's, it's, for me, I find that um, really f- makes me enthusiastic about Celtic that you can be so detached from the, the, the goldfish bowl of Glasgow and Scotland and be over the other side of the world and still feel attached to Celtic and good on you Liam for doing that mate and it, I find it difficult mate and uh, to go up in, at 10 in the morning and give people a bit of, a bit of content, uh, content for Celtic fans to watch is it's a, it's a credit to yourself mate and uh, I'm happy to be on the show tonight with you two gentlemen. Oh, thanks for having me on, mate. Always good to see you. And uh, yes, so uh, before we get started, of course, I'll do a wee bit of the old housekeeping. So, of course, I'll just remind everybody that if you've only just discovered the Boise bus, welcome aboard. Uh, why didn't you hit that subscribe button, though? No, over 3,840 something, I believe it was at the last time I checked. Uh, quite a lot. So, why don't you just join them? Hit that subscribe button. Of course, remember, hit the little bell notification to get a reminder when we go live. We do go live quite a lot. You'll find out very, very quickly. Of course, hit that like button. Helps us out with the old algorithm of them gets the Boise bus link spread around more people's recommended videos on YouTube. Of course, get involved in the comments section tonight. We always enjoy that, bringing up your comments and interacting with them along the way. And of course, if you wish to share the link of the Boise bus, then by all means, you can do so on any social media platform you wish. And regards to sponsors tonight, of course, PySports.com, our old school sponsor up there in the corner next to Liam. Head over to PySports, get your order in. Get those kebab pies, especially before Steve-O and Terry nab them all because they, <laughs> they do love a good, uh, a good kebab pie. Of course, you use that code BUS1888 and get yourself uh, 12.5% off on that one. And of course, our other sponsor, head over to edpharmacy.co.uk. Uh, I haven't actually thought of any witty ones here, so I'm just going to have to recycle one from previously. So yeah, as I like to say, don't be like a Dirk Barrichter, be like a Dyson Maeda and go all night. Head over to edpharmacy.co.uk <laughs> and use that code BUS10 to get yourself 10% off your order. And with all of that out of the way, what else do I need to do in terms of... Trivia, of course, I'm three weeks I'm three weeks of football nostalgia. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit sloppy just now. I need to get back up to match fitness here. But yes, I have got a trivia question for you guys. You're going to hate me for this one. But hey, there's only three answers. 
So it's not too right. supposedly free. So uh, tonight's question, no surprise, of course, for those of them, Brendan Rodgers, why wouldn't it? And the question is, outside of his time at Celtic, can you name any former Celtic player who played under Brendan Rodgers at either Watford, Reading, Swansea, Liverpool or Leicester? There are three former Celtic players who played under Brendan at clubs that aren't Celtic. So that's who we're looking for tonight. There are some... <laughs> one answer in particular is one of those ones that um, I'd imagine if it was like Sutton Death or something like that, like John Oaten Russell would want to strangle me for it. It is a stinker of an answer. But yeah, that is the uh, that is tonight's question. So guys, yeah, we'll get into it then. So we'll say tonight, it's all about a wee career retrospective on Brendan Rodgers. So for like the first part of the show, we'll look at what he was doing prior to Celtic, looking at some of the big moments he had there that brought him to Celtic Park. And then obviously in the second part of the show, we'll look at They'll reminisce about 2016 to 2019, some of the big moments along the way and talking points. So, obviously, Brendan Rogers, born in, um, oh, well, raised in Carlow, Northern Ireland. He was born on the 26th of January, 1973. He didn't have much of a playing career. That's because he was hampered by injury. He had the uh, genetic knee injury that just wouldn't heal at all. So, most of his playing career was um, playing at sort of amateur level Irish League. He did sign for Reading, but again, due to injury, he was hampered there. But Reading was like the highest club that he played for on his CV. Uh, but yeah, he was actually a defender. That was actually the position he played. So there you go, he was a defender. But he did move into coaching then at an early age and actually went over to Spain and started studying a few different methods. And it was actually Jose Mourinho, the special one himself, who um, obviously picked him up and brought him over to be the um, head of Chelsea's Youth Academy. And in 2006, he became the reserve team manager at Chelsea. Spent two years in the role before heading off to his first managerial job uh, at Watford in uh, 2008. But yeah, Liam, in terms of like an endorsement, and I know, I know, Liam, you're not too partial on Jose Mourinho. You've made that very clear whenever his name's come up on this uh, on this show. But um, <laughs> in terms of like a guy, you know, picking you to basically join his uh, backroom staff, it's quite a quite a big accolade, really. And this is Mourinho who's just went to Chelsea and wins back-to-back league titles. He's just won the UEFA Cup, unfortunately, against us in the Champions League the season later with Porto. He is the special one, as he's saying at that point in time. But yeah, it's quite a ringing endorsement, isn't it, when Jose Mourinho's taking note of you? I think it's a great endorsement because <laughs> in my stance in Mourinho, all is forgiven now. See, <laughs> Brett, forgiveness. How can I keep a grudge against Jose Marino? Especially when he manages Roma, one of my, my other favourite teams right now. So I, I think it is a ringing endorsement. I think when you see, you know, he didn't do it in the traditional way to go to Spain and do that and take that culture and, and try to implement your style there when you're, you know, you don't have the, you know, the the, the, the background of being a, you know, a distinguished player or anything like that. To go there, I think that's a very... It's a very brave and a very bold move, but and I can, I can say that now. That's that's who Brendan. He's bold and brave. Aye, <laughs> certainly is. But um, no, so he goes off to Watford. This it doesn't go too well for him initially. He only wins two out of his first ten league games, and by January mid-season, the team are in the relegation zone. Uh, but he managed to get a bit of form out of them in the second half of the season, and Watford did recover to finish thirteenth that season. But then in the summer of 2009, Reading came a-calling when Steve Coppel got sacked, of course, a team that Brendan was on their books in his playing career, so he had a wee bit of an affiliation there with Reading. Uh, he was obviously the bookie's favourite, and he spent a couple of weeks sort of rebuffing it and saying, no, 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 I'm committed to Watford, I'm staying here, I'm not going to Reading. And then he ended up at Reading, and uh, Watford fans um, were not too impressed with that and said that his uh, reputation is severely damaged. Now, I know... I know what you're all thinking. There may be a pattern developing here, but, uh, you know, it, it was, um, say, Watford, it obviously wasn't going too well. Reading, see, they obviously, well, they've made them a better offer, as we're going to talk about as well, and that's about to come up as well. And um, we're going through his career. Um, it's, uh, it just happens, and say it happened with, obviously, Leicester, but he's back now. But, yeah, Mark, and then, they, you know, he's, um, he's, he's made, I'm, I'm made a little bit of waves at this point because at that stage in time, I'd heard Brendan Rodgers' name getting mentioned from watching me bits of English football, talking about this young coach. But so far in his first two jobs, he's uh, what, well, he's been in Chelsea Reserves uh, manager, obviously worked under Mourinho, and then had not had the best of times at Watford. But yeah, I began, this is a really bit of the time I began to hear um, the name of Brendan Rodgers. And funny enough, this is the era where 
we were talking about podcasts recently and stories about Brendan and some of the some of the sort of oddball things that he can do. This is the 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 job that he's in where he does a team talk in Spanish just out of nowhere. Uh, I was watching a podcast the other week of a guy called Matt Mills, who is a defender we're reading at this stage. And he says, yeah, in the middle of a team talk, just uh, the training ground, and he comes in and he's midway through it and just begins speaking Spanish. And he goes back to speaking English. But <clears> none <throat> of the players that played for Reading were actually Spanish-speaking players. But it turned out there was method behind his madness, as there usually is with Brendan. A lot of people just see this this daft stuff that he does and don't understand. He's just, again, he's he taught himself, oh, he learned Spanish because there's a good chance, if you're a football manager, you're going to deal with a player at some point in time that speaks Spanish. So it turns out the reason that he did it, or he would just reel it out every so often, was just to keep himself sharp. He was just thinking along those ways. I say earlier in his career, before he became uh, the coach at Chelsea, he actually went to Spain and worked with a lot of different coaches and managers to like study abroad and you'll know, see their methods and so on. So despite his eccentric ways, Mark, he's always thinking, it's a bit of 4D chess going on there, isn't it? He's always thinking a couple of steps ahead with these things. Oh, he's a very career-driven man, and I think he uses every avenue to further himself uh, or develop himself. And if that's him developing football players and or developing his own uh, football intelligence, then they're going to see the benefit when in the later days of his career. And we found out in 2016 when he when he joined Celtic. This wasn't a guy that came in and this was his first rodeo. You could tell he'd been when about the place, worked under some good managers and see these. I think getting the sack. If he, I think it's quite humbling for a football manager. I think if you if you're brought up with success, I think I think a certain level of the, of the entitlement and then arrogance comes your way. So getting a sack at a young age and making you improve and constantly evaluate uh, yesterday's work before starting uh, tomorrow's work. I think he does he does that every day. Anytime I listen to the guy, I'm just so impressed. I was never one for. I must admit, I found a lot of press conferences hard to watch in the last couple of years. I didn't, I didn't watch many of them. They seemed a bit mm. bland and, and just quite, quite frankly, just a lot of shit. But any time he spoke for in a Celtic, uh, a Celtic tie, on, I, I always, I was engrossed with the guy. You know what I mean? I always felt like he was always trying to kind of educate the the room a wee bit. You know what I mean? I like that about him. I think. I think He's, you can tell he's worked with a lot of youth players because yeah. he's anything you're speaking about football, he's, he speaks about developing talent. Mm. And that's not somebody that's come in and he's maybe had a, a great career and he's come in at a, a first team level straight away. He's had to build his way up. And that's yeah. working with youth teams, then get on to be the manager of the reserve team. And that's a humbling experience as well. You know what I mean? It's it, it, it's probably given him a, a, a kind of a drive to nurture young talent rather than buy talent. If you look at the players, I know we're not talking about Celtic just now, but if you look at the players that he actually improved as, as a Celtic manager, yeah. that's came through his very first days as a as learning the, the game, you know what I mean, as a coach. And I don't think there'd be many players that have been successful under him that wouldn't have attributed a lot of their success to him and his work ethic and his intelligence, his football intelligence. And do you know what? I think that there's probably managers out there who have, who have worked under fantastic managers and no soaked, soaked in that information. Mm-hmm. I think if you look at Brendan Rodgers, the managers he's worked through, worked with, like your, your um, Steve Clarks and your, yep. your um, Jose Mourinho's, I can just imagine him taking the bits of information after him every, every opportunity and just kind of... Yeah making it malleable and easy in style. And, and again, Celtic will see the benefit of that. He's 50-year-old, Phil, and to think when he joined Celtic in 2016, he was 43, with all of that previous experience, that probably only comes by somebody that's not no had a, a, a long career. Because normally somebody touching 35, 36 nowadays is starting out on it, starting out their, their coaching career. So he's got a 10-year start on a lot of them. And today you'll have a CV that included Liverpool by the time you hit 40. Yeah. I, I, you must be good at something. And, uh, yeah, fine. And, and I just think that maybe that these these teams that you're mentioning, which are big clubs in their own right, in England, you know what I mean? I mean so many cities that they're, they're, they're in, you know what I mean? Of populations that, that dwarf it in these places in Scotland. So within that bubble, they're a big club, you know what I mean? 
and he's he's coped pretty well everywhere he's went. So he's 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 been made a man at a young age uh, through shit experiences by losing his career. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's steady moping about the house. He's put out there and says, "I'll get a football career one way." And if you remember, when he just came in the door, he was he, he gave the Celtic players this 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 pack, and it was about okay if you do this by your twenty. You earn you earn the fifty grand a week by the time you're fit, you're twenty nine, twenty eight. That'll come. That's a guy who's lost who's lost it all and wants to encourage players to nurture their own talent before they start looking at money and all the rest of it. And mm. he's he's been proven right time after time. Aye, for a shadow of doubt. Now it turns out with Reading obviously it didn't work out quite well after getting back to a club that he played for. He was gone after six months. Although Reading was also the place where the infamous Gucci belt story comes from as well. That's another one where the say the David Brent isms of Scott House says they're the Gucci belt one, where Matt Mills, that same player, goes in and says to him in a meeting, you know, Gaffer, we're bottom of the league here and I'm barely getting a game. And his reply was simply, took off his belt and just went, Gucci belt, and just put it down. And that was his reply to Matt Mills. <laughs> Oh, the <laughs> guy's like, okay, what, 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 good belt, mate, but what, what does that do itself? So that's where the Gucci belt story comes from. If you ever hear people talk about it, don't know what the reference is. Oh, that really. But yes, he <laughs> was actually sacked halfway through the season. So he's kind of, after, you know, he's had a spell at Watford, done okay, so he kept them up, but ultimately they expected better. He's had half a season at Reading, which didn't go well. So he's kind of in limbo. But in the summer of 2010, Manchester City first approached him and I, I wanted him to join Roberto Mancini's backroom staff, but also Swansea City offered him a manager's job, so it was a case of you can go and obviously be in the coaching team with Bill Mancini at Man City, who are obviously at this point on the up, or the money investment, or, you know, get back into the manager game, and he opted for Swansea City and this is where the magic began to kick in this is where it really started to take off for him, because in his first season with uh, Swansea City, who'd never been in the Premier League, you know, no Welsh team had been in the Premier League uh, since it started in 93 2010-2011 season with Scott Sinclair as one of his star players. Brendan Rodgers gets them into the playoffs. They beat Nottingham Forest in the semi-final and then they beat Reading in the final 4-2. Scott Sinclair scored a hat-trick. And yeah, this is definitely the first time that I became fully aware of Brendan Rodgers because I'll always watch the playoff final because you know, it's, it is one of the biggest games in world football, the English Championship playoff, the end of the Premier League. So every year I'll always catch it. And yeah, Swansea and Reading playing. I always kind of like to see the team that's never been in the Premier League go up. So I was kind of mm -hmm. rooting for Swansea that day because, again, they'd never been in the Premier League. And yeah, they uh done it in style. So Scott Sinclair scores a hat-trick that day and Brendan Rodgers gets himself up into the Premier League. And the first time I asked him was Swansea that season. So they go in 2011-12 season into the Premier League and he gets a pretty respectable 11th place finish along the way. They beat the likes of Arsenal, Liverpool and the eventual Premier League champions, Manchester City. Because 2011-12 is the season when Aguero scored the very, very, very late winner to get the title for Manchester City. So that was that season. Uh, but then in um, February 2012, uh, Brendan Rodgers would sign a three-and-a-half-year contract extension with Swansea. Uh, so does that sound familiar? Then by the summer, he'd be gone. So I know what you're thinking again. It's like, oh, wait a minute here. Bit of a pattern developing. But Liverpool came a-calling. So you've got to look at it from that point of view. But it's like, you know, he's had a pretty unremarkable start to his magic career. He's absolutely hit the ground running at Swansea. Um, and after two seasons, you know, getting them up and then getting in the Premier League and keeping them there, Liverpool came knocking. Now, Liverpool now, a days, are obviously one of the top teams, Liam. But at that point in time, Liverpool certainly weren't anywhere near the top. They were so far off at that point. They were very much a team that would finish sixth or seventh kind of living on past glories. At that point in time, they hadn't won the top division since uh, 1990. Yeah, they'd won some European trophies and domestic trophies along the way. They haven't been the Champions England in a long time. But ultimately, still a much bigger team, a much bigger draw than Swansea City. So really, I know he obviously signed the deal. I did say on the episode that I did when I talked about Euro 2016, because obviously I was there and I met a lot of Welsh fans when I was out there. And there's a few Swansea fans who, because we just got Brendan Rogers literally that summer, said to me, just watch, by the way, he will abandon you when you least expect it. Because it had happened to them in 2012. He signs a new three and a half year deal. He's committed. He's all in. And then he ran off to Liverpool. But I say, when you look at the, the, the Swansea, Liverpool, going to work with like Luis Suarez, who was... About to be firing on all cylinders. I mean, he was good, but he was about to hit top for him. But yeah, you can't really uh, blame him in that sense, can you, Liam? 
No, you can't. I mean, I, and, it, and it sounds really hypocritical saying that, but um, yeah, I mean, Liverpool are one of the unformed teams in the world, and when somebody like Liverpool sees something in you as well, you look at Brendan's ego, that would have all got sucked up. That would have just like the massive, you know, uh, going from, you know, Reading to Swansea to Liverpool. That's, that's quantum leaps, you know, that's massive steps. And so I think that was a massive acceleration for him and his ego as well too. And I think at that point in your career, you're you're fine. You're, you're doing everything you can to get acknowledged and you want to be visible, you want to be seen. And when someone like that acknowledges you, that's part of the course of that. And so I, you know, I guess he went. Now, I'm saying that as a young man when you're still trying to create your career on that. And let's see how that pans out towards where we, where we end up now. You know, like now that all that's gone from them, that fixation of something new, something better, prove myself. Well, he's proved himself. Now he's got a chance to a second coming to prove himself again. But this time, prove himself much better. Where the one where you know he's already met our expectations the first time. How high can he take us this time? That's why it's super exciting to be part of this with yeah. Brendan Rodgers coming back. You know, yeah. you can and and the fact that a club like Liverpool saw all that stuff in him, managed mm -hmm. to stop it. That was a bold move with them. That game has to be bold, Brendan. Aye, and <laughs> this thing, Mark, you'll remember this because it's something you've quoted a few times. Obviously, as part of him becoming Liverpool manager, uh, they did a documentary, I believe Channel 5 commissioned it, where they followed him around. I can remember watching the first episode where he turns up and there's quite a, a, a low sort of like interest from the fans outside Anfield. Because I mean, they just went from, I think it was Roy Hodgson, which was a disaster. Kenny Dalglish came in and sort of steadied the ship, but obviously he stepped down and this was the next one after that was Brendan Rodgers. Uh, so Liverpool are kind of... You know, lost at sea at this point essentially where they, they, they're they a big team they're a huge team but they're, they're so far off it so yeah the Brendan Rodgers appointment I think a lot of Liverpool fans were initially underwhelmed but I can remember the, the episode where he first turns up at Anfield has his unveiling he just does this thing where he just goes and walks around the park for like a couple of laps just by himself just to collect his thoughts and take it in because he probably couldn't believe it as well it's like Jesus, I've only been managing essentially for a few years and here I am at Liverpool Football Club. It was a huge, huge moment for him. But of course, the documentary came around, and this is where the David Brent-isms, where you want to see David Brent, or maybe even Alan Partridge, whatever what sort of comparisons you want to draw. There was obviously some moments of people, like, you know, top of how narcissistic he was and how cringy he could be with some stuff. There was, of course, the envelope challenge, where he told the players, you know, I've got a name and an envelope here of a player I think is going to let me down this season. And it turned out nobody was on it. He said, None of you are going to let me down. That was what he, this big unveil at the end. And, of course, there was the, the painting, the infamous painting. Now, you've obviously had, quoted the story a couple of times, and I still see people might come in the chat, especially in the last couple of weeks, going, for God's sake, the guy had a painting himself on his wall and try to use it to bash him with. And, obviously, my view, I take it away. What was the reason as to why he had a painting of himself on the wall? I well, it was given to him by one of the charities that he's a, that he's a sponsor for or an ambassador for, and he said... I think it was disabled kids in some some way. I don't know. It was uh, mm -hmm. And what happened was they they made him a painting. He says it's one of the most um, honourable things he's ever been given in his life. He was really privileged to have it, and he put it pride mm -hmm. in place. He said, "Where was I? Where was I going to put that in my cupboard?" He said, "These mm -hmm. kids who've who've came for nothing, no go to anything, and they've they've gifted me this, and I wanted to not disrespect them, and I put it in my wall." And, you know, if you walk into probably most Celtic players, probably, I'd say Callum McGregor's probably a different breed, but you walk into most Celtic players' houses, they'll have photographs of their own strips up on the wall. They'll have, like, Chris Sutton 9 will be on his wall and things like that. And I think that's just natural. So he's yeah. not got that. He, he, We don't call that narcissism, you know what I mean? And I think... in. You look at Michael Owens, uh, man cave. Have you ever seen that before, Cody? I think he's even got his face on the coasters in his bar. You know, what I mean? it's, it's embarrassing. Seen a few cringy things of Michael uh, Owens. All the guys are different kettle of fish, but mm -hmm. and he. So that's the that, that's the story behind that. And he actually, I think it was his book that he said that um, he didn't ever feel the need to correct anybody on it because he felt like I don't need to do that. And he could have easily quash that just by having a, a normal press conference and just dropping into the conversation and. It, Mm. It, it chose naughty, and that's what, yeah. that's a guy who's 
you know, he's he's confident in himself. He's he's in. He doesn't need any out, out uh, any noise for out with. You know what I mean? And uh, do you know something? We talk about people being eccentric. Anybody that's successful and most of them are eccentric. You know what I mean? Mm. They're different because they have got eccentricities. They go mm. out with the normal mold. You know what I mean? And that's what makes them different. If yeah. I mean. Albert Einstein was the most eccentric person you've ever seen in your life. Heard you in your life, you know. What I mean, he did no bad. I love the guy. I, I I I spoke to you two before the show started, and it's the most excited I've been as a Celtic fan since the last time I came in. And and I'll just repeat what I said to you before the show. I mean, uh, this is what this is the only thing that you can. I was saying uh, mentioned um, Liam, but the, the five year old Liam for talking about talking for talking sake and. The, the age is just now. It's just as excited as what what, what he was at five year old. You know what I mean? It, it, and Celtic's the only thing that can do that. Football's the only thing I think that can do that to you, or sport where you can be, you can be a five year old again. You know what I mean? You can be that excited about something that mm. it's okay to be excited. You know what I mean? This isn't a, yeah. a, a, you know, getting getting something new off of Santa Claus. This is something that really affects you. You know what I mean? And Brendan Rogers had brought that back to me. I must admit, like I. I felt really guilty about how little I actually enjoyed that last treble there, see, just a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. I had to leave the stadium as soon as we scored the third goal because of issues with my travel, but I, I didn't enjoy it that much. I, I just felt like there was a bit of dark cloud on it and I wasn't sure the direction the club were going to go. And I, and I was feeling guilty for, for days about it, you know what I mean? And um, I felt a bit spoiled and all, thinking that I'm not enjoying the treble. But I, see, when I heard Brendan Rodgers might be coming back, I, I just got my, my senses back up again and and you know what? It's it's hard for for us in the last six seven years, seeing us win treble after treble after treble. Mm. And you know what? That does bring an air of uh, kind of like so what when you win things. But this has given us a new lease of life. That this has made us excited about the next chapter. I think we could have hired uh, any number of the candidates that we've seen. And I don't think they would have brought the excitement of eh, eh, Brendan Rogers. This isn't the Celtic fans walking into a walking into a room blindfolded, forgetting about the past. Mm-hmm. We are more than aware eh, how the guy might have left it. But what we have got as well is we, we've got a, a a memory of how he changed our football club from the professionalism to the fitness of the players. The the, the actual behind the scenes just looked so much better on a match day. You could tell with the warm-ups at half-time. It just looked totally different from we've seen. And this guy's going to bring the Premier League level of standards back to Celtic again. I think that's been missing a lot. I think even with Ange, I don't like to diss him just for the sake of it, but I thought the fitness wasn't there with Ange. I thought his, his philosophy and his, his hard work was there, but the fitness wasn't always there. We kind of tailed off in mm. large spells during matches, especially... Yeah. Um, I think especially in Europe and that's when a lot of teams score a lot of league goals against you is yeah. and uh, Celtic always succumb to that and he, he'll bring that back to Celtic and the Brendan Rodgers we're seeing in 2023 mm-hmm. is probably even an upgrade for the one that walked in in 2016 you know what I mean and that's something to be excited about as a Celtic fan and I know there's a bit of background noise about how he's come in mm-hmm. I'm not going to try and persuade anybody, you know, to be uh, a bit paranoid about him leaving. But I don't sit the, the day Kyogo signed for Celtic and say, I'm not going to enjoy your 32 goals a season, Kyogo, because I'm scared you're going to be sold. I'm just going to enjoy what, what, what you're doing on the park and what, I'm going to enjoy what you, while you're here. There's no thing about when this guy's going to leave or if he leaves. You know what I mean? That's not how you, that's not how you can enjoy football. You just got to enjoy what he's bringing you. And he said this morning, this afternoon in the press conference that I'll guarantee you I'll be, I'll be here for three years. Now, that, that isn't it something that's going to be clipped and, and I don't think that's going to come back and bite him in the balls. I really don't. I think he's going to, he's signed that contract with a definite uh, mindset, I think, that unless he's sacked, he'll, he's staying. He spoke to the fans outside the stadium. I don't know if any of you two saw it. And he's yeah. closing the marks was. I know a few of you were upset the way I left, and that's why that's why I'm back. Mm-hmm. And that makes, that makes your hair stand up. I mean, that, that guy understands what he done to the Celtic fans. He says he's a Celtic fan himself, and I believe him. Mm-hmm. 
Always be, we've got a job when it comes, he's got a job when it comes to being a Celtic manager, so have the players, but we've got a job or not. As a Celtic fans, every time we turn up to that stadium, we're privileged to be there as well, you know what I mean? A lot of folk living over the world, for Liam in particular, okay. would love to be there. So all the, all, the only job we've got is to back the team, and that includes backing the manager, because we don't get the best out of that team, unless that manager feels like he's part of us and we're part of him. So let's just put the, the, the shit behind us, as much as we possibly can. Have your doubts, that's fine, but this guy's going to improve Celtic, so let us improve Celtic by giving this guy the backing that he deserves. Right, fair shadow of doubt. Uh, it's the only way that we're going to, you know, unity is the key here. I was glad to see, you know, with the, the, the cheer that went up today after that, um, after when he spoke to the fans outside. You know, he said all the right things, so, aye. It's so definitely the way we go. Yeah, sure. One of the I really liked to, that when I seen in this press conference was when they talked about you know, getting it right again, and he says he, he understood that he hurt a lot of fans, and a lot of fans were really upset by decision, and, and I think that's coming for a guy that's a Celtic man and somebody that's a Celtic mm -hmm. fan, and that as well. He's seen that firsthand. He's been to functions. He's had to go back to places where people have said, Brendan, fuck, you know, he did that, really. And to bring that emotion into a press conference, you don't see any other managers doing that that are actually having something that hurt the fans' feelings. You know, mm -hmm. that's a lot of motivator for him as well when he comes back in. It's to, it's to right that wrong. Everybody, mm -hmm. wants to, everybody wants to make sure that, you know, if you're... And, and, and it's an ego thing as well. He, he, he wants to, you know, it's never mind Edward. He wants to be adored. That should be Brendan's song for now on, you know, because right now, I think <laughs> I'm, I'm getting right now, right? We start to adore him because even what he's saying right now, he's coming back in. Whether we're going to all fall for that again, I don't know. I think our expectation expectations are being managed this time. A three yeah. though is a lot different than a rolling contract. A rolling mm -hmm. contract assumes you're going to be there forever, and you, you've got a flexibility, but you've not really got any security as well. You come in and promise, as Mark said, come in and promise for three years. That's mm -hmm. clarity of intent, and to me, I can manage my expectations around that, and so can the club. Because we can be building towards that. So who is our next manager in three years if it's not going to be Brendan? You know? Mm -hmm. Contingency plan. That's going to be the key. Um, but yeah, um, I, did, I was uh, going to just uh, go on. I'm glad you mentioned Europe because Europe was actually a seamless link to what I was going to talk about next because we were talking about <laughs> where Brendan is at this point in his career. Because also building up towards it, I mean, I've seen somebody in the comments say, what are you doing a recap for? Well, first of all, this is nostalgia. This is what we do on a Friday night. This is the whole gimmick of the show. I go into the archives. You know, this is what the Friday night show is. But it's had a couple of weeks off. So the whole idea is I do like a retrospective or whatever. It just so happens tonight's one is about Brendan. And rather than just talking about, you know, just all the things we've talked about in the last two weeks of press conferences today, you know, we're also looking at, you know, just what he did in the build up to coming to Celtic. And then we're going to talk about that first spell at Celtic and reminisce about some of the good uh, good moments. But in terms of like his Scottish football stuff, Liam, a bit of impromptu trivia for you. When he was Liverpool manager, he did get a taste of Scottish football. Can you remember mm -hmm. who they prepared against? Oh, you muted yourself. When you've given us the answer, you muted yourself. Oh, no. Was it, was it Hibs? No, it was the other one. It was Hearts. It was Hearts. Quite early on in his time at, um, at Liverpool, they were drawn against Hart of Midlovian in the Europa League qualifier, and they just scraped by by the skin of their teeth. They beat Hearts 1-0 at Tyne Castle, and Hearts got a credible 1-1 draw at Anfield. David Templeton scored and then signed for third division Rangers the next day. Uh, David Templeton scored for Hearts. So Hearts were actually beating them at Anfield, and then they got an equaliser, or they got a, what we're talking about, the winning goal in extra time. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't the best of starts for Brendan just in the door and a, a wee poxy team for the Farmers League up north, Hart and Midlovian, were holding them to, uh, in a European qualifier. But yeah, they just gave that was his first taste of Scottish football there was uh, against the Jam Tarts. But yeah, for his first season, obviously, he's in charge. They end up finishing seventh that season. Uh, they were knocked out the second round of the Europa League by Zenit St. Petersburg, something that would also happen to him at Celtic as well. Uh, Blue Suarez netted 30 times that season, um, which gave the team a bit of hope that, well, this guy's clearly capable. If we can get everybody else around him firing all cylinders and get the right pieces in place, this this could be a, a pretty good team. And, of course, the next season is the one that many, many people remember about Brendan Rodgers when he was at Liverpool, 2013-14. Liverpool had an unbelievable season. 
They got so, so close to winning the title for the first time since 1990. From January the 1st, 2014, they went on a 16-game unbeaten run, winning 14 and drawing two, which put them ahead of Manchester City, who they were fighting out with in the title, including a victory over Man City at Anfield, where, of course, at the end, the cameras from Sky zoomed in as he did a huddle. Steven Gerrard rallied the troops and said, you know, this is it. We don't let this slip. We don't let this slip from here. That was his exact words that he shouted. The camera picked it up. It's like, oh, Stevie, 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 Stevie. Oh, boy, is Karma about to come and slap you down, boy. And, of course, he played Chelsea. A couple of years later, Josie Mourinho's Chelsea. The little house of Josie Mourinho, who had nothing really to play for. But Josie Mourinho likes to spoil the party. And Chelsea went to Anfield that day, stodged it up. And Steven Gerrard had a calamity, to say the least. It isn't actually the result that officially cost them the title. And the deal was, had they beat Chelsea, they had a game in hand that they were playing midweek against Crystal Palace. Had they won that, mm-hmm. they would have been champions before the final day of the season. But of course, what happened is Steven Gerrard slipped as he went to uh, control the ball. Demba Barr ran through and scored. And then just had insult to Tanji Fernando Torres, made it 2-0. And uh, they lost to Chelsea that day. And then they went to Crystal Palace on the midweek, a bit broken from their defeat to Chelsea. They were 3-0 up against Palace and were back in the driving seat to put them top going into the last day. And in the second half, they lost three goals and drew three each. And Luis Suarez had an absolute meltdown on the park at the end. So, yeah, those two results after a 16-game unbeaten streak were uh, catastrophic. Manchester City won the final day. And, um, yep title was theirs in 2014. Now, you'd think that maybe they could have pushed on from there at Liverpool, but no, it went obviously pear-shaped for uh, Brendan Rodgers after that because they sold Luis Suarez in the summer of 2014. And to be fair, it was probably a force move because that is the summer when Luis Suarez once again bit a player in a game of football, which is a surreal thing to say. It was the third time he'd done it. He'd done it when he played for Ajax. He did it against Chelsea playing for Liverpool, bit Branislav Ivanovic, and at the World Cup, he uh, bit Chiellini, uh, Uruguay were playing Italy and um, Liverpool were like, this guy is just too much work. So he got a move to Barcelona. We talked about it. We did an episode about the 2014 World Cup win where this guy, despite being quite an arse to say the least, despite being a talented player, he seems to always fall up the way Luis Suarez. Some people just do it. And he goes from Liverpool to Barcelona and ends up being part of a forward line with Messi and Neymar and wins Champions Leagues and La Ligas and plays in El Clasico and Aye, after biting three different players. But yeah, he goes, but Liverpool end up making in a load of cash from that. And I believe Coutinho was also sold as well at Barcelona. Uh, it was either a January window or it was uh, that window. But obviously they made a lot of money from those two sales. And they just went crazy. Chris Scattergun transfers in the uh, the summer transfer window, bringing in the likes of Mario Balotelli, was obviously the most notable one. Lazar Markovic, Ricky Lambert, Adam Lallana, Emery Chan, Divock Origi. Alberto Moreno, all these types of players. And yeah, they just they just weren't up to standard at all. And Liverpool had a quite underwhelming um, sixth place finish after that. And then, yeah, the next season would begin, 2015-16 season. And after a slow start again, it was a, a, def- a draw with Everton in the Merseyside Derby at Anfield when uh, he got his uh, jotters after the game. That is the infamous clip where the news breaks on Sky as the pundits are like talking in the studio. And it's either Jamie Carragher or Terry Henry. The two of them are sitting next to her. And one of them puts his hand on the other one's leg in shock. Like, oh, Brendan Rodgers just got sacked. It's either Carragher does it to Henry or Henry does it to him. But it's like this, like, it's became immortalised in gift for him, like a reaction one. But it's like, oh, we've got breaking news. Brendan Rodgers has just been sacked. Because they're still in the stadium, you know, doing the wrap-up of the, the game. Uh, and yeah, Brendan Rodgers is gone at that point. So yeah, he's out of a job in uh, early 2015-16. He sits out the rest of the season. Jorgen Klopp comes in, takes over at Liverpool, actually leads him to a Europa League final and so on. Pretty much takes Brendan Rodgers' squad that he left behind to the Europa League final. But yeah, he's sitting doing nothing. Now, at the same time while this is going on, Celtic are obviously uh, doing their thing under Ronnie Dyler. Setting season, we've covered that season on Nostalgia. We've done that one in full. It's safe to say it wasn't the most thrilling of seasons. Yes, Celtic did do the very bare minimum that season. They won the league. They got what they had to do. But, yeah, we didn't win any other trophies. We had a disaster in Europe. We were in the Europa League group stages. Mulder beat us. Home and away, Chris Commons had a meltdown confronting Ronnie Dyler. Everything was falling apart. We signed Carlton Cole, Kazim Richards. There's some names for you, Mark, to put some shivers up your spine. Mm. We had Saidi Yanko and the likes signing that season. Tyler Blackett, who was so bad that he came on in the game against Mould because Semenovic got injured. 
surprise. And he got subbed off because he was so rank rotten. There was an incident where Charlie Mulgrew apparently walked off the park before we'd even finished the game against Ajax because he was injured and there was no subs and he just walked off essentially and just dissension in the ranks all over the place. And it culminated, it built up like a volcano to the semi-final against Rangers, first division Rangers maybe had. And uh, yeah, we drew two each for them on the day. They beat us on penalties. They got to the the uh, the final of the Scottish Cup. And uh, yeah, that was pretty much the curtains for Ronnie Dyla. A couple of days later, Liam, I believe it was, he, um, he announced that, yeah, things aren't really working. I'm stepping down. He's pretty much told by the board, like, you're, you're going. There was a few talks about Urban Legends, Liam, if you remember right, that apparently the Rangers uh, directors were a little bit uh, a little bit mouthy, apparently, after the game. Apparently, ben, uh, Dermot Desmond was angry from it, and we've talked about this recently. When Dermot Desmond's angry, things tend to happen. And uh, the result of that was, of course, we went out and got Brendan Rodgers. Now, of course, we've talked about it over the last few weeks. I'm trying to put my mind back to 2016. I can't remember who the favourites were in the bookies uh, in the run-up to it, because Brendan Rodgers' name seemed to come out of nowhere quite you know, late on in the, the running. Um, but, of course, I think this was quite strategic from the club. Now, I know, Mark, you were on Nostalgia a good while ago, and we were talking about the Invincible Treble season. And I think I asked you at the time, I said, do you think the club did this deliberately? Because we announced it on the eve of that Scottish Cup final, and it kind of made mm-hmm. sure that we had a lot of the headlines that weekend. Because, right. obviously, Rangers, after beating us, they were giving it the big end. There was a lot of bravado, a lot of, well, we're coming up to the top division next season. We're going to win the league. We're going to do this and do that. We're going to win the Scottish Cup here. Uh, but no, we um we made sure that we took those headlines that Friday night, Liam, didn't we? It was very strategic, I think, with what the club did there. Strategic is what it was. It was just like grasping, you know, all the glory from them because I remember when that came out, that was a celebration. You know, on a weekend, we were sort of lying low, no really bothering. I, all of a sudden, we had something to pump up a bit and go to the pub. And I remember what it was like. I wanted to phone up some of my mates and just chat about it as well because, you know, that point... It's Brendan, you know. Mm. No, it was it was it was meant. I mean, obviously, we got those scenes, Mark. Where and you said you were at it. You went down to the stadium, didn't you, for the the first time around when um, when you got unveiled the thirteen thousand fans, was it or something like that? It was it in that. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think it was a Friday. Got unveiled and Monday. Yep. We went down to the stadium. And oh, sorry, Friday was announced. Monday uh, was unveiled. But I was the night uh, before the Scottish Cup final. And I think I phoned my mom and says like. My wee brothers, he'll be off school on Monday. I'm taking him up to City Park. You know, I don't want him to he miss out on what I think will be an iconic moment for Celtic fans. And it, and it was. And I think the funniest thing that I've ever saw in a football stadium happened that day. There was a guy holding up a Wayne. He used, used his Wayne as a scarf. Yeah. And I'll never go over that. Uh, it was fucking hilarious. And quite a good day. They were, they were flinging, flinging out three Celtic tops. These ones here, flinging them into the crowd. It must have been. Dozens of folk were going for nothing. It was a it was a really good day actually. Right. Me, my dad and, and my brother didn't see that. And it's a day I'll never forget, mate. And uh do you know and I think uh, Lee Griffiths had just signed a five year deal just the days before and he, he came can't. out before it as he well with his, his, and he was sitting doing the, the zombie celebration. It was just good, you know what I mean? And yeah. Liam mentioned there that it's the first thing I did. I, it was Alana, Alana said to me, like, oh check your phone because she knew I was Buzzing at the thought of us getting him, I just looked at my phone and that was the end of my night. I was phoning my dad, phoning my mates, anybody that will answer the phone to me and just spoke about it because it was the only thing that I can remember that shocked me into that much excitement. When, and it, it meant nothing in the end up. I remember it was late on at night when we signed Robbie Keane. The first thing I did yeah. was going and blow it to my dad. And, and I normally still take one of big matches, it's the thing that I that a day is for my dad, I mean, even when I'm, when I'm leaving the stadium and just talk about it. And it's it's the things that you, that, you know, that I love it gives a wee bit of, uh, wee bit of flashback when you talk about the, the, these moments, especially the Brendan Rogers uh, unveiling. I I couldn't get to the, up the day. I looked, I looked a bit more diluted the day, but I think yeah. it was a Friday at four o'clock. That was a bit different for a, a, a sunny Monday that Celtic fans had a few days' notice for this. Was it kind of yeah. only found out about this last night on Twitter? In fact, the SLO only, only replied to a message saying, Oh, if folk want to turn up, they can turn up. Yeah. There was no organization. I think if they say that we're going to open the main stand, I think you're seeing people in their thousands maybe took a half day at work. And 
it's uh, again it's exciting times for to be a Celtic fan. This is the summer where every football fans get the the entitlement to dream big, and and as a Celtic fan, why not dream dream big because. It's going to be a good, uh, an exciting summer for us. I, I really do, uh, I mm. really do think that Celtic will surprise a few years this summertime. I think so. I think so. And uh, appropriately as well, we um that headline say we we kind of strategically put that out there the night before the cup final. Make sure we stayed on the back pages for the whole weekend. And uh, yeah, interestingly enough, you know, after Rangers giving it the big one, giving it all big licks after beating us, they actually became that. That pub quiz answer forevermore. Who is at the end of Hibs' uh, 114 year wait for the Scottish Cup? It was Rangers because, yeah, Hibs beat them 3 2. So, yeah, we had the last laugh, I suppose. And also, it was Anthony Stokes and uh, Liam Henderson that did the biz two players on loan from us. So, yeah, we definitely had the last laugh, I think, that season with the manager unveiling and them having that egg on their face of losing that Scottish Cup final. But, yeah, that was us off to the races now. Brendan Rogers was going to be the new manager. There was a real buzz similar to the Martin O'Neill unveil in the early 2000s. You felt like this is something special is coming here. So, yeah, obviously he comes in in the summer 2016. And, yeah, in terms of, like, big moments, see, we've done uh, in-depth, like, you know, breakdowns of all these seasons, 2016, 17, 2017, 18. So we're not going to go through every single moment and so on. But naturally, I think the first thing that we need to concentrate on is just, like, the results against Rangers first and foremost, because that is your bread and butter up here. Yeah, see, after what they did to us in that semi final, they were giving it so many big licks. So much of the media were buying into it that this Mark Warburton guy was going to be the guy that was going to lead them to glory. There was even one of the talk sport journalists, hosts, whatever, Adrian Durham, wrote a big piece about oh. how Mark Warburton is a future England manager. Yes, that one is still out there in the archives on the old interweb. Yeah, you can't live that one down. They're going up to iBooks with bread packets on their heads and stuff like that. And it was just like, my <laughs> God, the state of them. But I must caveat this and say it's not Celtic's fault that Rangers were pish. It's not their fault that Rangers kept buying muck because at the time, mm. nobody was sitting in the stands at Celtic Park when we're putting five goals past them going, aye, but Rangers are shite. What does it really mean? There seems to be a bit of... But a change in the narrative over the years since Brendan had left, where people were going, ah, but he was playing against a weak Rangers. I guarantee in 2016 when we were putting five past them, nobody was saying that. But yeah, that's where we start, Liam, is obviously that first one. You talk about laying a marker down, really making a statement. It's like, oh, I like his beats in that semi final last season. Oh, that's great. Brilliant. Good for you. Here, have these five goals. Moussa Dembele hat trick as well, when he did the that celebration with the three fingers. But um, mm-hmm. That that third goal when it went in, I remember say, where I sat in the stadium in the lower Jockstein and just that, the control, the ball over for Lustig, just the perfect control, half all the way into the far corner, he just runs off celebrating and just it was like, what a, what a feeling. That was 4-1 at that point, it was still to get better, but in terms of a, a marker, Liam, you can't really do a better one than that, can you? Put them in their place right away. Good, good that way. So, mm. Ange done that, Martin O'Neill done that, I think we've got, or maybe, I know, Ange got beat his first game, didn't he? Against Rangers. Uh, Hearts, yeah. Ah, right, fair enough. All right. But, um, to be fair, Brendan did get beaten his first game, the Lincoln Red Imps' first leg, but we did win the second leg, and overall, it's a two-legged tie, so we did advance, but, yeah, uh, we were a bit of a slow start there. But, yeah, in terms was, of the Rangers game, so. Oh, wait, what's, what's the three got in common? What's that? What? What's, the, what's the three, what's the three leg? First league match he's got in common. The three man. It managed. was Hearts. It was all Hearts. No, they all finished two one. Just come in my head oh, there. Two one. Two oh, one. Okay. United. Two one. Oh, hearts. Yeah, and two one. Who, who was who? Uh, uh, Ange was two one Hearts. Two one. So it was hearts, two Rogers one, and two one Dundee United. Just sorry, sorry, Liam. Oh, cut sorry. you off, anyway. Well, no. Anyway, I think any time you come out in your first uh, your first game, is you, you absolutely scud them. Mm. And, all your fans on side and what people have been saying in the chats and all that and in some of the presses you know what as soon as he throws together a really good some good results all the people that are still not on side i think will come on board and i think a really really good showing against rangers where you come out and you don't just grind out a win but you see if you come out the way that when you show that wait a minute we've got a system we've got players we you know we've got We've got a drive and, and, and a motivation right now. It's far superior to what we've had before. And if you're, no, if you're not up for it, we're going to absolutely humiliate you at every turn. And that, that's what happened. And 
Please, more of that. Love it. Oh, I oh, see. The feeling that day was unbelievable. And even at that point, you kind of knew that I will we'll be going to win this because that was old Joey Barton implosion as well. There's a famous picture on Mark of Joey Barton picking the ball out the net after Stuart Armstrong scored. And uh, yeah, I think it was the next day there was a fight at training at Rangers, and that's where it was. He was off ski after coming up and giving it big licks. What there's a theme here, there's a connection here. Seems to be the same thing or the same pattern repeating itself over and over again with them where they talk a big game and then they get slapped down essentially. Uh, but yeah, in terms of like dominance over Rangers, it just continued. I believe Brendan was uh nine victories on or nine games undefeated against them. But we go to we played them in the League Cup semi final no long after Mark, and you remember the the Dembele back heel goal. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Griffiths puts it across the goal and he, he goes through a defender's legs as well and the goalkeeper's legs. He actually not makes two people in a one-off. But I can remember the headlines after that because the first game ended 5-1 and this one ended 1-0. So naturally, suddenly we're talking about gaps again. We're talking about gaps as well for the last year. Oh, they've, oh they've, clearly the gap isn't as big as what that first game showed. That was an anomaly. But the way things panned out for the rest of the season, you know, going to Ibrox um, and beating them 2-1 in the New Year game, even though they took the lead that day. And this, again, is what you talk about. We talk about a manager being ruthless and stuff like that where you've got to make the big calls. I mentioned this on the, the TNF, but that's a game where... You know, we'd still won the game. You know, we got we got the victory, but you'll remember that that's the game that Eric Sviachenko was pretty much one of his last games for us. I mean, he played a few times after that, but he was a first teamer that just basically got dumped at the team, and it was um he was kind of at fault. I'd say he has his attempted pass out of defence was intercepted in the midfield. A couple of passes later, the Rangers scored, but yeah, after that he um he dropped out of the team. But Brendan Rodgers wasn't afraid to make the big calls, and when Deji Boyata came back in, who nobody. Nobody really, most people would forgot Deji Boyat was even still a Celtic player at that point. But yeah, that was like some of the big calls that Brendan made where it was like, well, yeah, you know, essentially off the back of a quite shaky performance and a game that we won. Brendan was not afraid to make big calls, wasn't he, Mark? No, he was not actually. He made a, a lot of brave calls as a Celtic manager. Don't forget, Craig Gordon was a well established Celtic keeper and he came in and dropped him for. Um, Doris Doris de Vries. De Vries. And, yeah. and then instead he just backed his man he dropped Doris de Vries pretty quickly as well he, he wasn't the one for you talk about ego I think he he put the team first with that you know what I mean he didn't he just keep on hammering the same nail he said no it's not working out I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll change it and he did that a few times at Celtic you know what I mean there's a couple of times where he he, he changed it and it, it wasn't the players that he signed you know what I mean and uh, sorry the players that he signed he dropped them mm. for the guys that are already there and that that just shows you a man's learning. And the the the, the first season, I remember I am I one of my old phones. I plugged in about a month ago. Funnily enough, actually, something hard work needed a phone, so just charged it. The, and there was a couple of podcasts just saved in the archives. And one of them was the it was the the Monday night show after that five line game you mentioned. And, Mm-hmm. You just mentioned there about gaps. I mean, that full show was Derek Johnson going on about how how Rangers oh. for 15 minutes in the second half uh, got close to Celtic, and I thought, fuck me, there's no change one bit. It's always how we get close. Mark, the was, this the, was this the Barry Mackay nearly scored? Yeah, he nearly he did. On about, oh, he Barry Mackay's shot that. went in. Oh, my God. And near the bar, it was, uh, it was just by, I'm pretty sure. But the gap was as big as he two sluts' legs. They the just keeping the Rangers <laughs> player that when, when then Billy back, he would have all through him. And mm. what a day that was. And then you had Rogers, I think it was the next season, saying, Be careful what you wish for. And they were all cheating and they fucked him 4 0. And we went to the Ibooks and beat them 5 1 and beat them 3 2, 2 0, 2 1. And you know, it just felt like. like I think every derby match, and I, I've got the same fears whether Rangers are a good team or no, because they're always capable of beating you. But See, back then, he obviously just felt like Celtic had a way of winning these matches, you know what I mean? Or at least the manager found a solution every time. Yeah. And you know what? Rangers fans will tell you, or you, you, you want to play against this, that, and the other back then. Well, it wasn't that when you're holding up banners saying bring on uh, 56 or 55. Yep. I mean, then the next season it was 55, then the next season it was going to 55, and mm-hmm. so on with the same stupid yep. zombie story. It's always next season with them. And- <laughs> And, every, and the Celtic fans are rewriting history as well. When, when they're trying to make excuses for how, why, why Rogers was so successful. See if, this, see if next year's successful, the same people will be saying, oh, Angie's first season, they won the league because 
Van Brom, Cross was concentrating on Europe. There will always be a, a certain web section of the support that will always degrade the old success to make yeah. the current success seem better. I mean, Ed, when Martin Hill's team was there, they're talking about would they beat the Lisbon Lions. When Rogers' team was there, they were saying we would they beat on Hill's team. And then you had Angie's team with that beat Rogers' team. And then this team, they're going to ask if it's going to beat the Dundee United team for 1987. That'll be the next fucking stupid one here. <laughs> Just live in the moment, I suppose, isn't it? Um, sure. And Brendan Rogers was, uh, was wasn't scared to make the changes. You mentioned Sphere Chengo getting dropped and all. Don't forget, mate. I mean, Colo Touré says a bit like a cult, a cult figure. Mm. See, up until, I mean, right up until, it, it, look at the Man City for each game. He was outstanding that night. Right up until, yeah. I think, it was a, the game against the German team, with Gladbach, I think. Gladbach. He was outstanding for Celtic. And I think he had a particularly poor night against that mob, a really poor he night. Did. And then he just faded, didn't he? He just he just went in the background. I think he just played maybe a couple of times after that. That was. That guy would have probably been on a lot of money. He'd probably have been a yep. signing that was supposed to come in and show the backup and give experience to the squad behind yeah. the scenes. But it's not a big call for him to be dropped, Phil, because up right. to that moment, I mean, he was outstanding in the 5-1 game. He was outstanding. Mm-hmm. See the game at Celtic Park with Drew Freach. I remember I was watching the game. I was at the game with my brother. I remember I said to my brother, look, that's the kind of games that that guy... Is, was a colossal colossus that match, you know what I mean? That's why this guy was brought in, just to show that defence up, you know what I mean? And there was guys in that team, I think Sviachenko was playing that night with some, with some line. He managed to get the best out of the, the players in yeah. one bad game against Germany and he dropped them. He did the same with Ambrose. Yeah. Ambrose, we all know, was an absolute uh, nightmare. He was like a building a shot, but he played a couple of games for Celtic. I see the minute he turned into F.A. Ambrose again, he was dropped. Yeah. He, and he, and there was a few players, in fact, Nadia Chiefji, Ryan Christie, a few of them, none, none of them can say that they didn't get a chance under Rodgers because a few diddies played in that in that uh, uh, red imps game and they all mm-hmm. proved, uh, proved that they shouldn't be there. Yep. You know what I mean? And so nobody can say the guy didn't give people chances and they made big calls and I think that's uh, signing a good Celtic manager. Um, yep. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go at 10 o'clock because... Uh, uh, um, yep. Sorry for dropping off earlier. I was just going to do a video the night. But that's all right. I've got see the three three players, right? Uh, one you've already mentioned, Scott Sinclair's one of them. But there's another guest that I'm. Can you tell me the teams again so I can double check that the, the other guest is right? Scott, Scott Sinclair's um, the not well, I it's, um, it's, it's when he was at um, Swansea, uh, Reading, uh, Watford, Liverpool. It's... In Leicester, right? Swansea, ready, and Leicester. Swansea, what's that? Colo Tori. I was going to Tori for Liverpool. Aye, that's what I was going to say earlier on because he, I'm sure he, do you not get man in the match for them at Real Madrid or something? You see, well, um, I, I was, although there was that, I had that Real Madrid game where he played a week inside, didn't he? By Colo Tori was playing in that one, so that's two. I was actually going to say for the, the, the Snide one that you said was a bit of a, a sneaky answer. I, I don't know why, but I was going to say Craig Beatty. Is Craig Beatty in there? Craig Beatty is an answer, yeah. But I had three, I had three <laughs> Snidey answers, but there's they're, they're the, you know, the Toury. And because I said, outside of his time at Celtic, can you name any former Celtic player who played under Brendan? Oh, outside, outside of his time at Celtic. Outside of his time at Celtic. No, but no, no. Cycle and Toury is fine, but there are actually three answers that call. Go to the I and Scott Sinclair, the the like the big name ones, but uh, there's three like sort of sneaky ones. Craig Beatty is one, so you've got that. So well done there, Craig Beatty was at Swansea, mm-hmm. former Celtic player. But yeah, there's two others, but one of them's an absolute is a bit of a uh, have to think outside the box for so this it, one. If they, they played, they didn't play for Celtic when, when he was there. Ah, yeah, that's, that's an aye. So basically, the players aye, nice former outside. Celtic players who weren't aye. That and were, Swansea Red and. Liverpool. David Logue's guest Craig Bellamy. Craig Bellamy had just left when Brendan Rodgers uh, took over as Liverpool manager. So it's not Craig, Craig Bellamy, but that's a good shout. Oh, uh, Watford. It's fine at Watford. What's well, got Dima? Dima not in. Um, but I had Craig beat it straight away in Sinclair, but I didn't realise it was outside his team. Yeah. Good question, Phil. That's, that's, that's why you're there. That's a tough one. But no, if you're jumping off, Mark, no, I appreciate you coming on for another oh, anyway. And get a, 
uh, spreading your uh, your knowledge and your love of Brendan Rodgers, mate. More than happy to see you. I wouldn't say my mate. knowledge, mate. I think you could put it at the back of my knowledge at the back of your night's ass with a paintbrush and my glasses. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was always great, always great having a wee chat with you, Liam and Phil. It was, mm. I'll, I'll tune it into the rest of the show. I'm going to put my leg up. It's pretty sore sitting here. No uh, right, boys, thanks very much. Uh, no right problem at all. I mean, we will, yeah. uh, we'll see you through at the end now because we're on for another half an hour, 45 minutes or so. So, yeah, we'll just see you through the end. But thanks, Mark. Cheers for no being problem, on, mate. Guys. Anytime. Mate, no worries, mate. We'll catch Bye. you later. Bye. So, I, Liam, so, uh, yeah, going back to how things were with Celtic at that point in Tennessee, but the victories over Rangers, you know, they were putting a, putting a serious marker down and putting them in a place. And obviously, something quite unprecedented happened in the final meeting that season, as you'll remember. We obviously went to Ibrox, which usually can be quite a tough place to go, regardless of what forum both teams are in, because it's a, it's a horrible place to play. It's a cauldron of hatred, to say the least, without a shadow of a doubt. Even at that time when we had a, a rather large away support. But uh, that final game in the 2016-17 season, again, the word surreal, I think, could be used for that one, because watching it, you just couldn't believe what was going on, where it was just goal after goal after goal. Every time Celtic went forward, it looked like they were going to score. We ended up beating them 5-1 on their own ground. You know, that picture will live forever more. The picture of the scoreboard, you know, Rangers 1, Celtic 5. It's an absolutely astounding day. That, of course, was a game as well, Liam, where uh, Siminovic put Kenny Miller in the air with that tackle. And, of course, 30 seconds later, we actually hit the crossbar from the attack off of that slide. That should have been Honestly, that is one of my moments. If I could just change something in that part of the Invincible treble season, which was phenomenal. See if that had gone in from Lee Griffiths when he bent it up into the top corner, right off the bat of that slight tackle. Oh, absolutely perfect. I mean, the reaction off of uh, old Tom Commentator, the, the Rangers official TV commentator, his reaction was uh, hilarious to the Semenovich tackle, where he's like, not to worry, we'll take it to the SFA next week. Um, it was absolutely incredible. But imagine if we'd scored off of that one. The absolute, um, the absolute meltdown that would have came. Um, it was a phenomenal one. But William, when you were watching that game, that that five one, as the goals are going in, what was it? Could you even find the words to describe it? Because I know that I was stunned. I was especially when the fourth one went in for Boyata. I was just, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend what was happening. It was a perfect bookend to the season. The way we finished, the way we started, and it was at, at that point you were just. Just got you so, so energised and so engaged and ready for the new season and that, and this was just something that was to come. And and the fact that this was going to become the normal, you know, and trebles and all that under Rogers, mm. I it was, a, it was an exciting time, and I it was a great way. I mean, you're right, it could have been more, could have been oh, a lot, could mm. have been whatever I, it wanted to be that day. Yeah, well, we, we we finished with an empty stadium practically. Just <laughs> we there. did, yeah, uh, the sea, the sea of blue seats, yeah. Like now, here. um. We've obviously just lost Mark. Mark's had to go, but the substitute board has just gone up on the Boise bus because off is coming Mark Kearney and on is coming a very dignified David Logue. Hello, David. Just doing my stretches, guys. Do your just... stretches, mate. Do your stretches, lads. You know, run it off. Get ready. You're coming on. Welcome, right. board, David. Good to see you. One in, one out. That's it. Well, I, th- I mean, you said for me to come on when I could. I thought what I'll do is I knew Mark was coming off at half time, so I thought I'll jump on. <laughs> Uh, when it's uh, when I see my number go up there, I quickly did my stretches and I, the ref checked my studs and <laughs> oh, they've sharpened up, I've sharpened them up. So here we are. Ah, good stuff, mate. Oh, good to see you on board, mate. <laughs> welcome in, welcome. In. You're just doing the best part. We'll just talk about Brendan's first run at Celtic, obviously, and uh, you know, reminiscing about the good times. So, yeah, as I say, the wins over Rangers we we're talking about, you know, just the absolute mm. play for our highlights. And if that first season wasn't good enough, obviously, in the second season. You know, again, we continued the dominance going to Ibrox early in the season, beating them 2 0. Rogic and Griffiths score. That's the game when uh, Griffiths, well, Griffiths did make a habit of tying the, the scarf to the post and so on, but there's the celebration in that one where he's running by the room loan and they throw the, the scarf on and he picks it up and sort of waves it as he runs by the govern stand. And it was just, we were just toying with him at that point. Obviously, later in the season, there's the infamous uh, Scottish Cup draw. Where Rangers fans suddenly again bravado, they fancy their chances, they're crowing and shouting from the rooftops. Apparently, the players were celebrating the dressing room, according to Graham Murray, and they were celebrating in Rangers pubs up and down the land. 
when they drew Celtic in the semi-final and of course Brendan gave the ominous be careful what you wish for and we beat them 4-0 and even Moussa Dembele scored the Penenka that day just for their cheek and of course there is the infamous 3-2 <laughs> game as well that season at Ibrox where we were down to 10 men for the Douglas Ross red card, red card, red card moment for Semenovic, quite stupidly elbowing Alfredo Morelos. He does. I mean, there's no denying that. It was a total brain fart moment. But again, right away, you know, Graham Murray, he's on the sideline. He's giving all that to the Rangers fans. You know, come on. And Brendan Rodgers, cool as you like, consulting with Chris Davis and just pointing out a few instructions to the players. You know, checking his wee notepad, you know, and then pointing out a few instructions. And then he waits a little while and he decides to bring on Austin Edward, the striker. He comes on and obviously the rest is history. Ends into the top corner. We win that day. We go on and win another treble. It was just a phenomenal, phenomenal time. Of course, that is a game that uh, we last saw a good allocation of away fans. That was the one that broke them once and for all. They just couldn't handle it after that. But uh, in amongst all that, um, David, we went on a 69-game unbeaten run. And I know there's obviously detractors outside the Scottish football goal. It's a farmer's league anyway and all that. Is that easy? How come the water team had done it? You know, it's like it can't be that. You know, it's, it's the consistency was unbelievable uh, throughout that run. There were so many incredible games. Uh, there was a game against uh, St Johnston in particular where we beat, I think, even five two in McDermott, and one of the goals is like every single player touches the ball in the build up to it. Um, but it doesn't even Mikel Wustig do like a Rabona pass across the goal, David, as well, just again to take the piss and then Dembele ends up scoring off it and it's just like we were just we were just firing all cylinders at that point. Yeah, it's just funny when you talk about the um when people obviously want to try and diminish uh you know uh, an invincible season, an invisible treble season. When uh, at the end of the, what's the old saying is you know you can only beat what's in front of you and that's what was put in front of us now nobody goes now nobody goes back and goes I see that Arsenal invincible team. How about how mm. shite were the rest of them? How shite yeah. were the rest of them? That's not a that's not a, a measuring stick that they were using. You can say, well, that's because it was the Premier League, David. It was like, yep, it's, it's the, if, if Arsenal went on and, and managed to just beat everybody non stop throughout the entire season, at no point did anybody question how poor some of the other teams in that league at the time were. Same with, you know, Sviachenko, he was a one of our double invincibles. You know, nobody goes here, but what, how poor was that other league that he was in, though? It's not a question that gets asked unless it's a Scottish league. Yeah. Or if it's Celtic. It's just not a question that gets gets brought. Hmm. But yeah, if, if it was that easy, then why is it why is nobody why had nobody else done it at the time? Yeah. You know? Totally. Um and of course you can look at Rangers Invincible, uh, you know, the season that never really happened because nobody was there to see it. Uh, oh, <laughs> um, you know, they didn't do a a, a com- complete invincible in all yeah. competitions, oh. you know. No, so, it's remarkable how again people are trying to put that above like what we did just a few years before. And it's like, but we won the two cups as well. In fact, Brendan Rogers has never lost a domestic cup game in Scottish football. Because uh yeah, every single tournament he's entered, he's ended up uh winning. But uh Liam, obviously, when that domestic run came to an end, and very typical, there was something poetic about it that it had to end in an absolute catastrophic way. It wasn't like a wee sneaky one right. nil, we got a snidey penalty against or something. We absolutely capitulated against Hearts. It was mental. But also, Liam, do you remember the full-time reaction from Brendan Rodgers? The first thing he did was he told the players to go and acknowledge the fans right away. You know, it was like, look, we should be proud of what we've achieved here. Uh, we've passed the, the, I believe it's the UK record, which was held by Nottingham Forest, I believe. We've passed that. But yeah, I can remember when we beat by 4-0 four, four by Hearts. And even though, like, normally you lose to Hearts in general, just lose by that score line is surreal. But, um... Yeah, there was just at the end it was kind of like, look, we'll just we'll regroup, we'll go again. Uh, but yeah, I remember his reaction, Liam, where he just told the players, "No, go and acknowledge the fans first and foremost." It was uh the right thing to do, obviously, because yeah, I mean the you know the support that they'd given them throughout that, and uh, yeah, it's just a case of we'll just dust ourselves off and we go again. I, you know, I, I remember being absolutely gutted after that. It was four nothing against Harps. I think it was. I mean, the, I. the wheels came right off the bus that day, and <laughs> it was just ground to a halt and. It was just going in for all angles and stuff. We just didn't look like we were we were engaged in it. And but right, getting the, the players to bring them together, that gives you some of the insight into the strategic savvy mm-hmm. at Rogers where everything becomes an opportunity, right? To motivate, 
to 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 build culture within the team and gather those players around and say, listen, you're part of an elite group that just finished 60, 68, 69 games unbeaten there. That was an unbelievable run. And for him to authenticate that and bring those players and sell that to them and turn a turn a loss basically into a celebration. Mm. Well, we came out strong the next game. You know, it, it wasn't yep. a slight anything near that but it was a brilliant way to acknowledge it acknowledge it and, and i think that's that's what you get with rogers coming in he's an absolutely brilliant communicator oh for a shadow of doubt you know and he and he's he, he, he more, and he's and he, and he looks for opportunities where i think he can make players better you know and that's what i'm looking forward to as well that how he makes yeah. players better and that's i think that's a good uh that's a good call out phil you know that game oh. there Without a doubt for them. But David, see during that run, I think one game that stands out in that whole undefeated um year and a half essentially it was. Uh the outside of the Rangers games, so obviously the Rangers games, you know, have got their own place in time, but there was a game against Murrowell along the way mm. that you may remember we were two and all down. We were talking earlier on there about being ruthless and talking about the tactics and how Brendan can change it in game. And this is one that does get forgotten because everyone will instantly go to well, I just mentioned a minute ago the game at Ibrox, you know, down to 10 men, 2 2, maybe consolidate a draw, brings on Edward. But see that game where we're losing 2 0 tomorrow? Well, do you know he took off Emilio Ezeguiri after half an hour and brought on Callum McGregor, who was influential in the turnaround in that game and uh, scored the first goal to begin the sort of comeback? And it's like, you know, even we, we decisions like that, because I can remember when I was thinking of that game, I was going, I'm sure McGregor did the start that game. I remember McGregor scores the first goal early in the second half to begin the comeback. I'm pretty certain he didn't score. And I went and looked up the Celtic wiki and I was stunned to see Izagiri was subbed off after half an hour to bring on. So that not only that, it was also a change of shape as well. Um, because Cole Toury was having a shocker as well that day. You thought Toury would have got hooked off because he was a uh, Louis Moult ended him that day. Um, but yeah, he mm. took off him, brought on uh Callum McGregor, who's instrumental. But that game is legendary. Tom Rogic, 90th minute, outside of yeah. his right foot, which was his weaker foot. Incredible, absolutely incredible, mate. Yeah, I was watching the, the clips of that game on Twitter yesterday, I think it was, or the day before. Um, am I right in saying it, it ended 4 3, didn't it? Did it Does not? I... Uh, did we get about a 2 0 and then they went 3 2 up? Am I right yes, then we equalised right away again. Yeah, yeah, that was a roller coaster of emotions that day. Mm. Um, I didn't actually get to see that game, uh, but you know, I was trying to keep up to date with it on my phone and uh. Yeah, that was it. I was a bag and I was just kind of staring at my phone as it like the, the, the sky commentary was kind of coming through, the vague commentary that was coming through. Yeah. And that was a bit of a nail biter. But yeah, that was um it's just another it's just another example of Brendan and his notepad. You know, we talk about Gavin Strachan and his laptop. Well, Brendan's a bit more old school and he's got his wee notepad and pencil and he just you know, like as much as we all enjoyed our, our, our Ange well, we see it for two years. That's one thing that you could say that you could probably say that he wasn't very. I mean, Mark's touted it a lot. His in-game management maybe wasn't there. Uh, you know, he had his game plan and that was it. Whereas, you know, the camera would always like to pan over to Brendan when it wasn't going our way, and you could see him writing away in his notepad. Mm -hmm. Rarely did you ever see him shouting or, or, yeah. or you know, watching the game. He always had his head in his notepad, and then next thing you know, he's tinkering away. And like I mean, like that the Rangers game when he brings on Edward once the the red card happened, you go, What are you doing? And <laughs> and obviously I, game changer as well. So yeah, I mean that that's just one of the many examples of, that you could say Brendan was has shown that he's got the um the in game management that can really change a game. Like yeah, like you said like I think Mark said on the show earlier, like there was he he'll always find he he would always find a way if it mm. wasn't working. And you know, yeah. like to bring on Callum McGregor uh, and taking his gear off after after half an hour, you might be questioning what's he doing here. Yeah, but obviously it was a stroke of genius, and obviously, it was, like I said, it was a memorable game. It's, oh, it's one not incredible. to be forgotten about. So yeah, I think the SPFL YouTube page posted the highlights of it the other day. Very topical because we were waiting on the imminent announcement of Brendan, and I'm like, hmm, the SPFL page has just decided to post highlights of one of the most legendary games of Brendan Rodgers' time at Celtic. Is that a clue? Is that a little inkling of what's coming? Uh, it was quite a topical choice at the time. But I put up uh, Pat's comment here because he mentions Armstrong, who scored the goal in that one. We'll move on to talking about what you were saying a minute ago, about players that improve. And I think that is one that people go to right away. Stuart Armstrong, who when we signed him uh, from Dundee United, him and Mackay Stephen, you know, they came as a, uh, came as a duo. 
He was a double pack essentially, and I said that many times on this show. We've talked about that particular era that season. I was more excited about Mackay Stephen because he was a tricky winger. He was the one that got you up at your seat. You know, you think of Celtic with over the years always having like tricky wingers and stuff like guys that run by people. So I was so excited for Mackay Stephen, but Dundee United fans, I remember on social media at the time, were more gutted to be losing Stuart Armstrong. They kept saying, that's the guy you should be excited about. And uh, they were right in the end, but it took a while for them to get going. He started okay under Ronnie. I'd say the second season with Ronnie, everybody was just pff, all over the place, that one. Stuart Armstrong could have left quite easily in the summer of 2016, and I don't think anybody would have batted an eyelid. But um, his stats for that season, he came on all leaps and bounds and found levels. I mean, I don't think he's he's reached since. I know he's been down to England, played for Southampton. He's had plenty of caps for Scotland now. But he's never really reached the level that you saw him playing at that, that era at Celtic under Brendan. Uh, he was phenomenal at that point, wasn't he? Oh, I, I, Absolutely. I mean... Um, <laughs> sorry, hold on a sec. And what are we? Give me one sec. I've got somebody just ringing the door right now. A visitor. No worries. That's fine, mate. No problem at all. in the middle of the night uh, over there in Canada. Oh, of course, so. aye. That's right. It's, um, what, two in the, two in the afternoon? Uh, mm-hmm. two in the afternoon. But no, Pat also thought I was saying wasn't Dyla playing Armstrong in one of the wings. He was the infamous... Uh, it was never that Malmo. Mm. Played him in the well, wing as Malmo. Yeah. I mean... Armstrong, I remember him because my um, father-in-law, he's a Dundee United fan, and uh, he wasn't too happy when we when we signed Mackay Stevens and Armstrong, and of course Nadir Shifty. Um, oh yeah, Nadir, yes. He also came in that that window, I remember? And obviously, I was at youth, Phil. I was like, oh, that guy Mackay Stevens, he's gonna, he's a baller, him and uh, my father-in-law. He was like, no, no, it's uh, Stuart Armstrong that you want to be excited about he's the yeah. he's the one you should be excited about you bastard <laughs> like, you know <laughs> so and i remember uh sitting in the pub uh with lucy and it was i think it was the was it the inter milan game inter uh, milan against i three each draw where he scores well yeah two. i remember what so we're watching that and of course i'm sitting there saying see the fucking players that we signed for your lot you can just mm. have them back absolute garbage yeah and mm. of course they <laughs> they scored the goals, and I'm like, uh, so I've always, always rated that Armstrong. Yeah, always oh, aye, always. always good. Always <laughs> got good. Any other, you got any others that uh, hit Dundee United by any chance? <laughs> you know? Ah, he, he, he was that great box to box midfielder, and of course, he scored in the cup final as well. Liam, uh, the Tom Rogic goal was obviously remembered by he, um, he scored obviously to get his back level after Johnny Hayes had the cheek to put Aberdeen ahead. With that volley, but I still Armstrong cool as you like. I think we talked to us when we did the Scottish Cup episode a few weeks ago, saying, Do you remember the celebrations? There wasn't any celebrations when Armstrong scored. It was like, Get back to the center circle. We go again, you know, one each with Aberdeen. No, no, we're not here for that. We're here to win this one today. But he did come on leaps and bounds, of course, in the second season as well. It continued. There was a whole thing about his contract was running down. He obviously signed a contract extension, which allowed us to get seven million in the deal. But yeah, he's a player that I feel like since he's left, Obviously, he's going to a harder league and playing for Southampton, who are going to be a team that are under the cosh. But, yeah, he's had his wee moments here and there, getting a, a goal here and there. But, yeah, he's not really ever pushed on. You know, there's been a few players that we've sent down there that have then had a move after Southampton or after the club that they joined and go on. Like Van Dyke being an obvious one. Wan Yami, he thought Armstrong might be one. But, no, he's, he's uh, still at Southampton to this day. But I think... Um, one that stands out massively when it comes to players that improved is probably James Forrest, Liam. Uh, James Forrest, up to that point, you know, he came in under Lenny from the youth team, and he'd always had his moments, like he would go through, I'd say, like, sort of peaks and troughs, where he would have a wee spell, a wee purple patch, a few games where he'd get a few goals, and that, but he would just kind of, you know, fade out of games and whatnot. He'd never had really any consistency. You could tell there's a player in there but there was one thing as well about him was probably like he wasn't bulky enough. He was very lightweight. He got pushed off the ball and so on. And I remember when Brendan Rodgers came in, there was a story about James Forrest's contract expired in December of that year, midway through his first season. James Forrest was out of contract. So in that summer, he could have spoke to anybody and signed a pre-contract and moved in the January window. I remember there was a real push that finally Brendan Rodgers said like in he went out to like the pre-season training and he said, you know, a priority of his was to get James Forrest down a new contract. Of course, Forrest scores the first goal of the league season that year. 
and he just pushed on uh, massively. Obviously, the Patrick Roberts thing, many people point to that, that there was some real competition between the two of them fighting for that right wing spot. But even after Patrick Roberts had left, because he came back for that second season and he was injured most of the time, Patrick Roberts, so Forrest did play a lot. So his place was kind of comfortable when Roberts came back the second for the second full season because of his injury problems. But Forrest just didn't let up at all, did he, Liam? There was games against like St. Johnston where he scored like four at McDermott Park. He absolutely terrorised him. Well, I had really thought that we had got as much as we could out of James Forrest at that point, as did a lot of people. And I know it's just exciting to see what, what Ange can... Oh, sorry, what, Ange, what Brendan can do here. We're going to have to get used to that, I know. <laughs> no. um, but, you know, see what he can do there. And I don't know if he can still get a tune out of Forrest. I mean, I days might be behind him now. I mean, mm. he's still a good player. He's still still relatively young. You know, don't he's still got a bit of speed. He's, he's got he can cut in. If he can fit him into the style, it'll be interesting to see what he does. But I'm more excited to see what he's gonna do with some of the players he's gonna inherit from the current yeah. squad. And I think my I, I think the one that's really going to benefit is going to be Matt O'Reilly. I'm interested I'm excited yeah. excited to see what he's going to do with him. Because I think yeah. that a very Stuart Armstrong type thing, and mm-hmm. I think we know he's got a goal in him. Yep, he definitely does. Boy, he always he always seemed to be fighting it. Took him a very long time to score his first goal this year. I think it was after Christmas before he before he put one in the back. Yeah, of a lot of moments where he had a chance to shoot Liam, and you always felt like um, he was just backing out of shots and looking for an extra pass. There was plenty of frustrating moments at the stadium this year where you, you could see it open up in front of you, just right. sitting in the stands. And he's full on, he's got an opening and he would just look for another pass and you're just like, well, you just shoot. Right. So I'm excited what he's going to bring to the midfield. That, that seems to, he seems to have a lot of success of finding mm. roles and, uh, you know, what midfielders, you know, the instructions of what they have to do and, and what's yeah. the, um, in the midfield. Well, I think Angs was very much, con, you know, uh, concerned about the strikers and the inverted fullbacks and how they were going to overload pressure and things like that. Whereas, you know, I think Ange is very, I'm sorry, Brendan is very good at getting the midfielders involved in, in the scoring. Yeah. And that. That's where you see, you see Callum McGregor, you know, yeah. when you know, he was a striker, but, you know, then modified as a midfielder. And you've seen that scoring touch come back under Rodgers. Yeah, that did big time. And goals too, right? And you've seen that carry on. And Callum's career, you know, going by the last two years with, you know, with, with Ange, that he could score important goals in an important time. And I'd mm-hmm. love to see how he can develop, um, you know, both O'Reilly, Hatate. Yep. People talk about uh, uh, Turnbull, David Turnbull getting a tune, you know. And so mm-hmm. it'll be interesting to see how he does that and, and how they bulk up. I think yeah. O'Reilly can de- definitely benefit from bulking up and being a bit more harder, a bit more courageous on the ball. And I think that's what we're going to get, you know. Mm. Well, speaking of midfielders, David, and obviously Williams mentioned him there, he's now walking back into a team where uh, I would say the finished article, Callum McGregor, because McGregor got his start under Dyla, and he came in, started really well, got a few goals early on and kind of faded out, and again, became victim of that second season under Dyla where most of the team just seemed lost, nobody knew what was going on. But Callum McGregor began to come on leaps and bounds under... Uh, Brendan Rogers and uh, those couple of years that he was there, and since then McGregor has only went on from strength to strength, and now it's kind of came for sort of like you know full circle. Essentially, he's coming in, he's getting sort of finished product of Callum McGregor, the final forum essentially, the captain now as well, and um, it's exciting times for McGregor and Rogers to work together again because uh, again, as Liam says, central midfielders seem to be something that Brendan works really well with, so I'm intrigued to see that going forward and. Uh, yeah, see, the first time around with McGregor was good. I think it could be even better what we're going to see this coming season. Well, he's alluded to what he really <clears throat> thinks about Callum McGregor in his latest interview. Uh, he went and met with uh, Brendan out in Mallorca, you know, to send him out there to have a, you know, to, to get him up to speed with what he's got in his squad. Yeah, he's the captain, but obviously Brendan obviously takes. You know, um, hangs on every word of Callum McGregor. He takes his, takes it very seriously. He obviously trusts what he has to say. Callum McGregor could walk into any Premier League team at the minute. Maybe minus maybe Man City 
I think you could walk into another Premier League midfield at the minute. The, I would, you know, he's not going to be going anywhere, I don't believe. But, um, you know, if Ange or somebody like Ten Hag or something like that want, wanted him to go to Man United or Tottenham or wherever, he would do. He would walk into that midfield for me personally. I think he's a great player. And obviously Brendan thinks the same. Uh, and obviously <laughs> he knows a lot more than I do, that's for sure. Um, so to have a player at the absolute peak of his powers now, you know, he sees he sees things that other players don't see on the park, and I have mm. Cal McGregor at his disposal. Like it's only going to be, you know, it gives. You know, when he got Cal McGregor, he wasn't the finished. Cal McGregor, he wasn't the finished article, and he had to um, obviously coach him and uh, mould him into the player that he has now became, and the captain that he's now became. And now he's got him already. Like it's a great starting point for Ben, and it only gives it'll only give him more confidence. I think is that right? I think I read that we had twelve midfielders on the books at the minute. Jesus, so, you you know, so he's got a he's got a hell of a lot of players to to pick from, uh, and obviously Callum McGregor is right at the top of the pile. Yeah. But so if he likes his midfielders and he likes his centre midfielders, he's got a lot of them, especially when you include the likes of Sorrow and all you know these boys coming back from loans that he will need to try and figure out what he's going to do with them in terms of clearing them out. Uh, at least I think I'm, I agree with Liam. I think um, O'Reilly will thrive under uh, yeah uh, under Brendan as long as he stays. Uh, I'd like to think Atati is going to stay. However, you never know. Uh, he's mm. he's obviously getting a lot of um, interest from from down south naturally, especially with Ange going down there. But I'd love to see what mm. Brendan can do with the likes of Atati and O'Reilly. And you're right. There was a lot of times where I think O'Reilly. Was almost. I think he lost his confidence in front of goal. Yeah. That's played a part in it, but he used to complain a lot that you know there'd be space to make a, a more direct pass to the middle or take a take a shot, and it would always be a case of putting it out wide to Maeda yeah. or to Jota or whoever. And I'm like, and I'd be like, do we need to be doing that every time? Uh, I wanted to see him uh, wrap his laces through it, and I think uh, yeah. around it. So I think you'll um, we might see a wee bit of him. More of that, just a bit more confidence instilled into like so Riley. Uh, hmm. Yeah, and that's what I, I, I well, ironically, the first goal they did score but... this season was one from outside the box. We were against St. Mirren in the cup where, yeah, he even had like a sort of big breath sigh of relief when he scored the by his bearing down on goal and it opened up in front of him. And there was options either side, and a lot of people in the stadium just shouting, shoot. And I just wrapped his left foot around it and pinged it in the top corner, and it was like. That's what we wanted to see. That's exactly what you should be doing. But um, yeah, he was always looking for that extra pass. So hopefully it becomes a bit more adventurous with things like that. Because the amount of times you see it happen at Celtic Park in particular, you know, we keep passing side by side and wait for an opening. You see the opening in front of you from where you're sitting in the stadium, but the players seem to look for an extra pass. So hopefully we'll start seeing guys like Matt O'Reilly pounce on the chances. Um, yeah, because that's that's the one thing that really I think he just needs to add to his game. So hopefully he can be an Stuart Armstrong sort of success case and add that to his game and really come on leaps and bounds uh, this coming season. Of course, Scott Brown's another one we've talked many times about the Scott Brown transformation. But again, he was going nowhere. Club captain as well after that Ronnie season. There was a whole issues with the cliques behind the scenes with Ronnie with Chris Commons, Brown, Mulgrew. Stokes and all that, um, but yeah, there was uh, that one, and then um, what even guys like you know, uh, Ryan Christie, who is a bit of a late one, people forget about it. they always think of the early part, but Ryan Christie was sent out on loan a couple of times. But when he came back, he mm -hmm. thrived for that before up to the point when Brendan left, he came in in that semi final, I believe, against Hearts at Murrayfield and took his chance. And through that sort of autumn into the early winter, Ryan Christie was scoring goals for fun. He looked like a player transformed and, again, bulked up massively, put on so much muscle mass, and it was like it was crucial for him. But, yeah, after uh, Brendan left and Neil Lennon got a hold of him, Ryan Christie sort of regressed a wee bit and became more a sort of just shoot on sight type of guy. And, yeah, well, well I'll need to talk about the 10-in-a-row attempt season at one point somewhere in this series. And, uh, yeah, that'll definitely be getting mentioned. But, no, no doubt about it. There's a lot of exciting possibilities going into this season, going by the track record of what Brendan showed us, the players that he worked with previously and finding that extra level. But, of course, other than the players he inherits, naturally this is a talking point that comes up all the time about Brendan, people beating him over the head with it. 
Uh, already we've seen a couple of moves getting made. Uh, it seems like the transfer system seems to be different now at Celtic, but going back to his first spell as Celtic manager, naturally there's a lot of hits and misses essentially for every Scott Sinclair. There's a Yosef uh, Malumbu or a Christian Gamboa or whatnot, or Emilio Izaguirre returning for another year when we needed a left back. It's like, oh, we're not going to sign Puccini, but yeah, you can have Izaguirre back on a free transfer for a year. So yeah, there was a few few debatable transfers, but when he did get it right, he did get it right, William, in terms of like, obviously, Odson Edward um, was the the club's trans, uh, record transfer. We utilised the whole take him on loan for a year, sort of try before you buy, essentially. Get a feel for the player, know what we're getting, and obviously end up paying the nine million for him and of course edward was worth it in the end because he was a quality player but russell's been saying this quite a few times in a few of the shows recently he thinks that nine million is going to get beat this summer what do you think liam do you think we are going to push the boat out and beat the nine million transfer or is it going to be a case that we're going to spend relatively big on a few different players but not necessarily over the nine million well it'll be interesting i think I think we might see a record transfer for a goalkeeper for start. Oh, I think. On who? Okay. On who, mate? Please don't. That's... If you say Danny Ward, I'm leaving right now. No, oh, oh, <laughs> Danny Ward. <laughs> no. If you say but, Danny Ward. <laughs> it might be somebody with a more European pedigree. You never mm. know. And that's, you know, so it could be Spanish or French or, you know, somebody that's played in Europe. Well, mm. you know, Harp's got that in his locker as well. But, um, I think that's what we'll see the money spent and somebody that's got European experience, somebody that can maybe become that defensive midfielder that we'll be looking for, that can or or, or somebody to drive the, the team, but somebody with a European pedigree that knows and is comfortable winning in Europe and playing in that style that players can look up to, respond with and not just show a bit of more experience on the part when we're coming into this European campaign. And so I like mm-hmm. to see the money spent in that and and uh Obviously, you know, like another striker, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd take Gio Kamakis back if we're, if we're still on the forgiveness route. Do, uh, doing all right out in the MLS from what I see. Doing and so bad. is Lewis Morgan, though. So is Lewis Morgan. Aye, true, true. Although, <laughs> I will say this, right? Now, well, Jack Kamakis is, you know, he's, he's had his time and I'm not advocating for come back, but the people that I see arguing this point about Lewis Morgan's doing well out there, right, to try and sort of bash how rubbish the MLS is, I guarantee you every team in the MLS will scalp most of the teams in, where we play on a weekly basis. Oh, I Teams like Motherwell and St. Midden and all that, I... they will get rattled <laughs> by teams like the Portland Timbers and all that. So the standard is definitely better. Is it better than the Glasgow Derby standard? Uh, probably not. I think Celtic and Rangers would hold their own against the MLS teams, but everything else we play on a weekly basis... The MLS teams are much, much, much better than those teams. Much better. I'd like Celtic to start chopping a tree down and giving the uh, Callum <sighs> McGregor and that uh, a bit of wood to tell them that they're the man of the match rather than a the, bottle of champagne. The one for Jack and Marcus the other week, the golden spike of excellence. It was astounding. The video is just... <laughs> Jack and Marcus does, does not want to be there at all. He's just got no energy for it. He was like, a, what am I even doing? That was his Man of the Match award. It was, it was weird. <laughs> Can we get a fight up. and win chant going at the next episode? Fight and win. Seattle Sounders. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, but, yeah, he's Jack and Marcus. He would have been interested. You know, if had he stuck around and as what it is now, he's away. It would be interesting to see him under Brendan Rodgers, wouldn't it, Liam? I think he would. I think he'd be that sort of player. You could see him benefit from the... You know, from the performance training and that that Rogers brings to the squad, the fitness and that, and then I think as well, yeah, he'd get a tune out the same way he did Dembele, or uh, mm-hmm. uh, but you know, he seems to be that type of striker. You know, different to what we're doing right now. Oh, I think I'm, I'm still not sure if he gives us that, but mm-hmm. I can see Rogers definitely making the move for another a, a power striker to what offset offset Kyogo, and it'll be interesting mm-hmm. to see if he can find a way to play too. Two up front. Yeah, yeah, that's true because a lot of people hold that against him as well. About he only really plays four two three one, and so it's a one up front formation. And well, Knox obviously when he was here before it was Dembele or every uh, Edward through the middle, uh, and then it was Sinclair on one side, Forrest on the other. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see because um, you know you'd like to think after four years of being away down in the Premier League and doing pretty well with Leicester, all things considered. Um, you know, he's picked up a few few more tricks along the way, a few more systems that he can fit for them. Because how many times are we screaming for the whole two up front thing, especially in domestic games? 
uh, at home, you're playing your St. Mirrens and Murrowells and stuff like that. And it's like, man, you know, two up front here, you know, really go to town on them. So it would be good to see something like that from time to time. But um, yeah, it's, it, we'll, we'll just need to see we got that one. But in terms of the transfers, obviously one that paid off massively and people are still calling out for it, David, is obviously Moussa Dembele. Where did he was actually signed by Brendan is another thing. I know that he officially joined Celtic after Brendan became manager, but the story yeah. is that that one was in the works for a wee while uh, beforehand. That's what um, I oh, That's what but, I read as well, yeah. But obviously he's a free transfer right now. Now, again, I'm not really calling out for you know bringing players back and so on because you know it's, it's different. I think when a player comes back, I'm struggling to think of times when We've had a successful spell for a player coming back from a city. Probably Fraser Foster, maybe the best example. But like Sean Maloney had two spells and the second spell was very, very underwhelming. So with Dembele, I think we need to try and find a player of his ilk. There must be a player out there that is of his standard that we can obtain in similar means to how we got Dembele before. You know, I know people say, oh, he's a free transfer now, ask the question, but... I think um I think that ship sailed. I think there was a bit of tension between Brendan and Dembele. And I know, I know obviously things have changed between Celtic and Rogers, but I just feel like Dembele's probably would see it as a from a playing standpoint as a step back as well to go for yeah, the plane. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Dembele would come back to Celtic as much yeah. as I would like to see him come back. I would like to see him come back. And I do think it's we are more than capable of affording him to come mm-hmm. back, but He's still not played in the Premier League, and I think that's his uh, goal. He's won us. He's won our league in Spain, so that's ticked off his list. Mm. Uh, unless he likes the like the, the lifestyle out there. I know he didn't play much for Athletic Madrid, but he does have a medal there. He's not going to play it for anybody else in France, I don't think. Uh, and there was talk at Everton being interested in signing him. Mm. Uh, I'm right in saying that Nottingham Forest were looking at him as well, but um, Nottingham think... Forest signed everybody last season. It wouldn't shock me. He could go they... back to Fulham, you know. They're yeah. doing all right, aye. They're doing you know, very well. They're under Marco Silva. I think Premier League's probably more what he's after, but I do think there are players out there that we, whether it's getting a Dembele of his ilk when we sign Dembele, or we go and spend the kind of money to buy a player of Dembele's. Hmm. But then again, it's a difficult, it's a, it's a difficult one. I still think, and it's lazy. It is a lazy link. Uh, but I've been touting. I wouldn't mind seeing any actual coming to Celtic. Uh, former Man mm. City player. He'll definitely, if we've been, a, you know, affiliated with the City Group for a while, he will have been oh, on yeah, that. Sure, um, yeah. He will have been on that list at some point. Obviously, Leicester signed him for quite a big bit of money. He did. But he did. He's now in the he's now in the championship. He might find he wants to go and play under Brendan, who, you know, put a bit of faith in him, and you know he dropped. And Jamie Vardy wasn't getting as much game time, mm-hmm. and he actually was getting a. Um, but I think there's. I think if I'm right in saying there was a team in the Prem that was Aston Villa. I think were mm-hmm. there was starting to be a bit of links with uh, uh, with him there. But I wouldn't be. I wouldn't mind if we asked the question of him because I think he's a good player. He's still only 24, 25. Yeah, he still is. Do you think he's been around for a long time? Because he really scored he against us. Seen. Interestingly, for Man City, scored against us in the Champions League. Yeah, yeah natural. I think he's better than the Championship. Um, in mm. actual, but yeah, but the Leicester want to completely rip up that entire squad. Then I that's just that's just me. Obviously, yeah. there's no links. It's just lazy linking for me. But I, I've always I've always liked the player. I liked. The, I kind of was hoping that we'd maybe. Try and mm. sign him a long time ago before he went to Leicester, but of course, I think they paid 25 million or something daft like that for him, so yeah. that was always going to be out of the question. But maybe now, you know, you never know now, you could know. maybe ask the question. Aye. Well, I know that where's, where's our resident viewer, Scott Howe? He's been in the chat for the last few weeks pushing the Jamie Vardy button. I don't think that's going to happen. I think Jamie Vardy's like, what, 36? He signed a two year extension at the start of last season because the the investment at Leicester obviously went kaput due to the, the issues with the coronavirus affecting their, their income. So investment really slowed up at Leicester a year ago. Uh, but yeah, I don't think Jamie Vardy will be here. But I keep seeing Scott Howe proof saying Vardy. Same Vardy, but no, I think I think that ship has sailed well, Jamie Vardy, because he's definitely seen better days, essentially. It's not 2016 Jamie Vardy anymore, which was pff, he was unbelievable, but yeah, I can't see that one. But uh, in terms of just some of the other transfers along the way, see, when it comes to Brendan, when you look at his Celtic transfers, he does get beaten over the head. Way. 
obviously we tried to make a move for John McGinn. We've talked about that till we're blue in the face, essentially. And we know what happened there. In the end, the club kind of settled on let's get Yusuf Malumbu in a free transfer who'd been released by Kilmarnock, who by all accounts was doing fine at Kilmarnock, but that was more because he'd found his level. But yeah, when he came to us, Malumbu, it was just like, that's that's not the guy. Then there was a whole story about Puccini. Apparently, it was pretty much a done deal. And at the 11th hour, it was changed where Mr. Lawwell apparently got involved, moved a few goalposts, and that deal was out the window. I say that was a fullback that we badly needed to get in the door. And then we end up with like Emilio Azagiri coming back on a free transfer. And yeah, some of the some of the transfers were bad. Obviously, there's a Marvin Compere one. You know, quite curiously as well, Brendan Rogers did a press conference that January window. That's midway through his second season and talked about, oh, he was really happy, you know, getting everything that he wanted that window. And Marvin Compere was one of those players who played a grand total of about 60 minutes, I think. He played a game in the cup against Greenock Morton and played about an hour and then got subbed off and that was all he ever played. Ironically, he got some of the loudest cheers on trophy day. Uh, when he got up to get his medal, it's like Marvin Colpier just swaggering up to get a medal, and it's like, how how have you even qualified for a medal, Marvin Colpier? How have you done that? But yeah, he would always get the ironic loud cheers, but yeah, there were a few clangers, and of course, the one that haunts him, you know, if still people talk about this daily, is of course the Marion Shred moment. It was an unbelievable bit of foreshadowing. I don't know why so many people didn't see it. I didn't see it at the time. I didn't see the danger signs. I just thought it was just a bit of a I don't know, just a, a, an odd comment, but I didn't see the danger in it. I just thought, oh, well, you know, he's whatever. So another point. But yeah, a few weeks later, he was gone after that. But of course, the Marine Shred one was, I don't know why we're signing another one. We've got lots of wingers. Um, but yeah, that, that's obviously the type of stuff that happened. And Shred, of course, became that player, Liam. He was the best player that you've never seen because every week that he didn't get a game, it felt like his aura grew online. And fans kept talking about, oh, this guy's amazing. And it's like, how do you know? We've not even seen him. We've barely seen this guy. It felt like every week that went by without him in a team, he would just become better and better. Apparently, the urban legend of Marion Shred just grew and grew. But yeah, they were just some of the, the transfers, some of the shockers along the way, Liam. So hopefully, hopefully we're not going to see any of that nonsense again in Brendan version two. Eh? What an absolute shocker it was that the next time we saw Marion Shred, he was lining up against us in a Champions League. <sighs> I know, I know. You know Crazy. Would have expected that, that that would be the next time we saw him at Celtic Park, and uh, and, yeah. and he was one of their informed players at the time. Somebody to watch. Did he score a goal that night and he got disallowed from offside? Yeah. It did. That's right. Well, right. you know, brought the place then. Mm. But you know, I, it, you, you're right. That was the writing on the wall. That was the flags, you know. And yeah, see all those flags again. We'll know right away if this is an signing. sign and. You know, it was interesting what he said in his press conference today when he was talking about the, the backroom team. And he says, how astute they are. He says, they really understand and have a great knowledge of the markets we yeah. now compete in. And that's very, very telling. And that's showing that, OK, like now we've got our scouting is far and wide. We're not just going the, was it the Lee Congerton route where we, we, we look at the championship for somebody struggling that. Now we've got this opportunity. Yeah. And I think this is where Rogers will excel as well. There's a lot of there's a lot of players who play for teams, you know, like Portugal, things like that. Look like a Jota, guys, uh, Matt O'Reilly, guys are on the peripheral of their national teams that regularly show up in big tournaments. They're going to want a Champions League showcase. They're not going to get that playing with Bournemouth or, you know, Brighton and and, and stuff like that. You know, they'll they'll, they'll not get that big game, that um, the, the big game stuff that they'll get with us in the Champions League and. And I think that's a nice uh, thing that he has as well to recruit players with. And I think Rodgers can, I know, I think he'll excel in that. And that's where I think our money will go. The big money will go to those guys, that sort of player. You know, it'll be somebody that's on the cusp, just banging on that international manager's door to be mm -hmm. part of the first team and playing yeah. champions will help get you there. So I think that's attractive. I de definitely, definitely is. And one thing that is going to be attractive, and this will be the sort of final talking point we'll concentrate on, because we've done an hour and 45 minutes. So it's the word that everyone's talking about, David. It is the buzzword that is going around with this appointment. It's been, you know, the, the press release essentially is talking about a focus on it. It's also it's Europe. And again, it's another thing that gets beaten, you know, a stick to beat Brendan with. Because overall, were the results good enough? Well, no, really. But in context, you got to remember, we also were playing Barcelona. PSG, Bayern, 
top, top teams. But then again, it still isn't very nice to be losing five goals at home to PSG, as good as they are. Seven goals away to PSG and seven goals away to Barcelona. Could we have been a bit more pragmatic? We still lost the game, probably. But uh, would it have been a bit more of a respectful performance? Yeah, possibly. We have, you know, shutting up shop a wee bit more. Being a little less uh, risky against these teams, because obviously we get weather from pillar to post in some of these games. Then there was other ones where we just shot ourselves in the foot, like the Bayern Munich game at home, where uh, we started a bit slow. We gave away a stupid goal where Dedrick Boyata tried to pass the ball back to Craig Gordon. The two of them got in a muddle. And I believe it was either Serge Nabry or Leroy Sani just goes round the goalkeeper around Craig Gordon, puts it in the empty net. But we get ourselves back in level terms. You know, it's one of these moments, one of these great moments at Celtic Park on a European night. The atmosphere is just gets getting louder and louder as the game's going on because Celtic are battering Bayern Munich, they're pushing them back. Callum McGregor gets equalised and you think there's only one winner now. And a minute later, Bayern Munich go up the other, part, the other end of the park and score. Celtic doing Celtic things in Europe. So there was there was a bit of a contrast when it came to the European Champions League games where we either got absolutely lettered or we just did stupid Celtic things in Europe and shot a cell on the foot. But of course, to get to the Champions League, David, he had to actually navigate some qualifiers. And of course, as I say, it didn't start too well because uh, we did play that infamous Lincoln Red Imps game. You know, a team from Gibraltar, a part-time team. Ah, no problem, we'll go over there and we'll squish them. But as Mark said earlier on, a few <laughs> a few French players did get a game that night. You know, people forget Chifty started up front. I think that was the last competitive game that Effie Ambrose played for the club. Ryan Christie, before his moves to Aberdeen, played that game as well. Um, but yeah, they were just they just couldn't get into the game at all. They ended up losing at one 0 But it is a two legged tie. At the end of the day, it's all about moving on to the next round. And I think you'll find Celtic were in the next round of the the tournament. So in the end, we did navigate it. But yeah, we we, we had a wee fright in that first leg. But um, that campaign though, Astana we then played next from Kazakhstan. I want to say they're from. And we had a bit of a tough one there. Drew 1-1 out there. It was a last-minute penalty from uh, Dembele to get his uh, through. That was, his, de- was that his debut goal? Was that his debut goal? Like, that was his first I think he came off the bench that because Griffith scored a penalty in the first half and we got a penalty in the minute. But the goal we lost that night, Craig Gordon goes walkabout about 40 yards out of goal and the guy just picks up the ball, empty net, and just dinks it right up into yeah. the, over him in the empty net. But um, speaking uncomfortable, though, after getting by Astana, we go obviously draw Hapwell Bersheva. I don't know about you, David, but I can remember just after I was watching that game behind the couch at points because that was uncomfortable. One of the goals we lost that night was a cross came in and Craig Gordon caught the ball but didn't know that um, Saidi Yanko was standing just to his side. And as he turns to go and throw the ball out, he bumps into Saidi Yanko and then drops the ball and it's like into the net and it's like... Oh my God! It's a, and they, we can see the penalty. The only time Craig Gordon saved a penalty in a game, he's he's got as bad a record as Joe Hart when it comes mm-hmm. to saving penalties. But that game was uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, at that point, David, the task was get Celtic into the Champions League by any means necessary, well, and it? it was uncomfortable. But we got there, mate. I remember the uh, watching the the Lincoln Redhams game. I was. Uh... It was actually in a hotel room uh, in Stoke because we were going to Alton Towers. So uh, I was not in the best of moods the night before we went to mm-hmm. Alton Towers. Um, just watching it on my phone on a dodgy stream. Uh, and I was like, nah, this, this can't be right. That's not, that's, <laughs> this, can't, this can't be working. This must not be the, the, right, the right game. Um, and then I remember... Yeah, it was Dembele's first goal because I remember when he stepped up to it. My, mm-hmm. I got a text from my dad being like, the size of the balls on this guy. And he's like 19 years old, first goal. Yeah. You know, this is a potential of getting knocked out <laughs> of the Champions League before you can get there. And the young lad steps up and puts it away. Um, mm-hmm. and yeah, there's, there's, um, that game you're talking about there, like I can't remember the name of the team. Bear said, Sheva, Hapwell uh, Bear Sheva. Yes, yeah. that I. That one uh, <laughs> just rolls off the tongue. Oh yes, um, yeah. That was uh, that was a hard watch. I was watching that uh, with a, a few guys around at uh, actually my old boss's house. Uh, mm. It was just on in the background. I managed to sneak it on because we were in for like a, a work night thing. I was like uh, football on. Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a difficult watch. Um, yeah, but yep. Mission mission completed. That's what he was. That's what he was 
asked to do and he did it so yep. you know what more could you ask him ask yep. of him if that was what you asked him to do and he done it uh could the results later on been better yes obviously yeah. but yeah. phase one completed um mm. i think uh, it'll be a different a different uh brendan rogers side that we'll see line yeah. up the champions league uh, in terms of the way we Obviously, he wants to play an attacking, aggressive style of football that we all want to see. However, I think uh, he has, over uh, his time at Leicester, playing in a team that still they want to play an attacking, aggressive football because that's the style of play that he likes to play. Had to learn to be a bit more pragmatic, a bit more defensive at times, a bit more sturdy at the back to get to grind out results uh, in the Premier League and in Europe. I'm looking at his uh, run that got him to the the Conference League semi-final. He played uh, Rennes and PSV Eindhoven on that uh, yep. on that run, uh, and the results were two 0 at home to Rennes, uh, and then he actually lost two one away um, in the round sixteen. But obviously, caught, got through to the next round, and then it was a nil nil draw at home, and a two one win away at PSV Eindhoven. And of course, it was a stud, it was a sticky one-all draw at home, and then they lost mm. just by one goal to nil uh, against a US Mourinho's Roma side that went on to win the competition. Dead. So he is, he's he's definitely had to change his game, and he's obviously learned. He's a much yeah. wiser manager now th- than he was yeah. the first time around. So I think you know we liked our wounds after those drummings we got, and listen, those those that PSG side and that Barca side could. We're hammering teams six, seven nils left, right, and centers. Yeah. It was not like a, you know, they were only getting one nil wins here and there. And then of course yeah. this wee Diddy team for Scotland come along and we get smashed mm. by them. You know, we yeah. um, and you gotta respect them a little bit to go toe to toe with them. You know, yeah. yeah, we probably just angered PSG when we scored so early on. I remember watching that and just like and they roused and laughing in Neymar's face. Yeah, like you know, they're different. And, and uh, how old was Anthony Ralston at the time? Seventeen, eighteen. Somewhere, yeah, yeah. And having to put, having to play, that that was a position. This is the thing. This is this is where you laugh at. We were in a position playing against Neymar at the peak of his powers, the biggest name in world football at the time, yep. against the best footballing team at the time. Yep. And you're playing. You're having to play an 18 year old Anthony Ralston because we didn't. We, he wasn't backed in terms mm-hmm. of getting the. The players yep. that he wanted, and you know that was where we found ourselves. And we're not going to be in a position where we're going to have to just laugh at the big guys, and yeah. the, you know, <laughs> uh, just to kind of hide the fact that we're getting a doing. Uh, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a totally different. Whether the results are going to be, you know, are they, are they still going to be losses? We don't know yet, mm-hmm. but I don't think they're going to be as uh, hammerings as we as we've seen that the first time around. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he what he does. Yeah. It's all going to come down to the draw at the end of the day. We're in the dark until August, the end of August, when we see the draw and see what we get. Until then, we can't we can predict anything. Um, but that those Champions League campaigns, Liam, though, obviously gets through the, the qualifiers in the first one. So a bit uncomfortable against Beersheva because we're 3 0 up in the first leg and then Beersheva get two back. We go on and win 5 2 and then second leg lose 2 0 and they miss a penalty. But we get there. We obviously are famous that season for. Pep Guardiola's all conquering in Manchester City, won their first 11 competitive fixtures out of 11 or something like that. Then they played us and we held them to a 3-3 draw and then they had a bunch of shaky results after that. They actually finished third that season in the Premier League. It's the only time Pep Guardiola's finished outside of the top two in any uh, league that he's managed in. He's always finished top two apart from that one season. But that season, Brendan Rodgers went toe to toe and got the three each draw. But yeah, some of the other results also let us down. Glad back at home that Mark talked about earlier. They just they just turned up and scooshed us that night. You know, they just made it look so easy. Out in um glad back ourselves when we went out there, we drew one one, which is quite a credible result. But Carl McGregor had a chance to win it with a chance uh, late on in the game, you know, just cut it too fine, just past the post. Uh so it's one of the ones so obviously we finished bottom that one. The second campaign, you know, we get by uh Linfield. Rosenborg, who we become accustomed to in the next uh, couple of seasons. And uh, again, another one of these weird games where Celtic seemed to make it more uncomfortable than it needed to be because of much like the Beersheva game the year before, Liam, do you remember we played Astana again in the playoff for the second season in Brendan? We beat them 5-0 at Celtic Park and you're like, wow, 
we're cruising into the Champions League this time. But at one point in the second leg, we were four one down. We ended up losing four three on the night, so it was like eight four on aggregate. But there was generally a point in time in that second leg where you're like, I can't even believe we're going to blow this. We're five 0 up in the first leg. You're like again, you're thinking this is Celtic doing Celtic things in Europe. But luckily, we got through it, Liam. And one thing that Brendan has got on his record is he has got an elusive away win in the Champions League. Only two managers have achieved it. The Celtic, Lenny beating Spartak Moscow in 2012 and Brendan Rodgers beating Anderlecht. As it would turn out, that Anderlecht result, which we thought we would push on from and have a really strong campaign, was the only win that we got. And we only got through to the Europa League uh, second round by finishing third on virtue of the record against Anderlecht because Bayern Munich and I think PSG both finished on like 15 points and both Celtic and Anderlecht were miles behind on three points each and we just just get through because they came to Celtic Park and beat us incredibly um, but yeah we, we did get through uh, but sadly as is the curse with Celtic at the moment in Europe and it gets to games after Christmas Liam we played Zenit St. Petersburg and even after we beat them 1-0 in the first leg capitulated in the second leg it's so 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 vital that if we find ourselves in the second phase of European football after Christmas this coming season we can't have a result like that regardless of who we draw in whatever competition we have to get over that hurdle how can so many teams so many different managers now have the same problem after Christmas Liam it's bizarre isn't it well, I think it was a lot of our recruitment. You know, I remember starting a lot of the games we had near Baton as our sec- centre back. You know, that's something mm-hmm. going on yep. for going in. It doesn't matter how you recruit, but if you do get those sort of injuries going in or, you know, whatever the, you know it's happened to us, we, we've always had an unsettled back four going into Champions League. And, and oh, even during Ange's time as well, with Stephen Welsh playing um, in Champions League football as well and near Baton. No. Remember Dean Murray had to play qualifiers for Ange? Remember that as well? Aye, so mm-hmm. I think that would be because he, he wants to get a settled back line and get the back to, you know, you you got you got Starfield, you got, you got CCV hopefully still there. And it's like, okay, build it up around those two, see what we can get, you know, and and so that we can move on in the Champions League as well. We also need an upgrade uh, upgrade on the goalie, and we certainly need an upgrade upgrade on Greg Taylor in the left back position, him or Burnaby are not gonna I don't think they'll cut it in Ange's team. Um mm-hmm. Burnaby yep. can have a wee Spanish word in his ear. Well you know, well, I can speak Spanish apparently, so you know, I, yeah, good. Well, yeah. Maybe we might get a tune out of him, but but I think both of them they leave us very um we're very weak in the like they don't they, they don't win a lot of aerial battles and if we're not playing the inverted fullbacks they struggle defensively, and 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 that's where we get beaten. When I'm thinking of those games at Gladbach and and uh, you know Saint Petersburg, you know although they weren't playing, that that seems to be always seems to get a team that can cut down that wing and, and tear us apart. Yeah, in the middle of the park. So Aye. we need to tighten that part up, and I'm hoping that Rogers has got something planned there as well. You know, oh. I think good way Alistair Johnson on the other side. I think Ralston's okay as a deputy. I've, you know, he's went, he can went, always be better though. Can uh, always be, you know. Then he have his good season in his, his, his second time under Ange, but um, ah, it'll be good to see what we get there because I think those are two areas I think that we need definitely to to strengthen up if we're going to do anything in Europe. Oh, for a doubt, for a shadow of a doubt. So we'll just need to see what the summer brings us because yeah, in terms of uh, Brendan's last attempt at Europe, where uh, Celtic was obviously. The ill-fated uh, Champions League campaign where we lost to Athens in the third out of four qualifying rounds. Vasilius Barkas was in goal for uh, AK Athens. What did he do? Uh, somebody decided that he was a good keeper. We should look at him sometime in the future. Yes. Uh, but of course, we dropped in the Europa League. We ended up in a group, which I'm still to this day, I'm stunned that UEFA allowed this to happen. But we had a Red Bull Salzburg and a Red Bull Leipzig playing, even though Red Bull Leipzig go under a sneaky name of Rassenball Sport, which is still RB Leipzig. They're still sponsored by Red Bull. That's interesting. But yeah, we were in the group there. Although, incredibly, there was no shenanigans going on. It seemed to be all above board. By the time when the draw came out, I went, that can't be allowed. That surely, surely can't be a thing. 
And we were also reunited with our old pals Rosenborg as well, who we just couldn't escape at that point. They were just everywhere. Mm. Um, and obviously we, we we got nine points in that group, which usually is enough to get you out of the group. But it was um, but a bit of a tight one in the end because we had to rely on Rosenborg, who had zero points going into the last game, scoring a very, very, very late equaliser against Leipzig to salvage a draw after we lost to Salzburg at home. And that was enough to sustain through. So another team basically of our good pals, Rosenborg helped us out. And again, though, we go into the second round of the Europa League and we end up drawing Valencia, a team for La Liga. And again, they turned up at Celtic Park and just, just beat us quite comfortably in the end. You know, I was talking about the Gladbach game just a few minutes ago from the, the first Champions League campaign. Just to, they just turned up, just a team from a better league, just a better standard of player. And they just made it look so easy that night. They beat us 2-0. And uh, out in Valencia, we lost uh, 1-0 as well. So that was, that was Brendan's last European games for Celtic. So yeah, it's definitely something that we need to uh, address. And I uh, say it's the word of the moment. The club are very much putting a lot of emphasis on it. Today, obviously, Brendan's press conference, uh, the fan media one, I believe he was asked about, you know, what is European progress? Would it be just to win a knockout game? And he just said, well, it would be a start, which he's right. Of course, you know, that would indeed, you know, that would be a bit of progress right away. But, um, yeah, we have to we have to find some sort of formula to ensure that we're not going out to, you know, these teams in the second half. It's even worse so when it's teams like Copenhagen, or Bodo Glimt, you know, these type of teams. Valencia, you can maybe make, you know, you can go, okay, well, fair enough, they're a team from La Liga. Zenit St. Petersburg, arguable, you know, Russian league, they have got a lot of money out there. It is a reasonably high standard. Some of the other teams that we've drawn as well in the second round of Europe, you've got to remember, we've drawn AC Milan, we've drawn Juventus, we've drawn Barcelona. So a bit of context involved, and we're not always in Europe after Christmas as well. Usually we make an arse of it in the first half of the season. But there has been some in recent years, particularly Copenhagen and Bodo Glimp, where it's like we shouldn't be going out to these teams at all. So these are the type of things that we need to address. And uh, if we find ourselves in the second phase of European football, whether it's Europa or Champions League, then hopefully, hopefully Brendan has come back after getting to a semi-final of the Conference League with Leicester. He's had a, a taste of latter stages of European football, regardless if it's a Conference League or not. I'd be pretty chuffed if Celtic won the Conference League, but he has had a taste of last stages. Hopefully, he's picked up some pointers from there and learned from that, and we can obviously address these issues going into the new season. But yes, that wraps up just after two hours there. A wee Brendan Rogers career retrospective. I say at the start of the show, we looked at what he did prior to Celtic, and then obviously there we spent the, like, the last hour of the show just going over some of the highs and some of the lows of uh, what happened in his time as Celtic manager. Now, before the judge left us, he confused the hell out of me because I wasn't expecting to give me answers for the quiz. So I said at the start of the show, and I think he's worded it wrong and then it's confused me. I had said that the question was, outside of his time at Celtic, can you name any former Celtic player who's played under Brendan Rodgers at Watford, Reading, Swansea, Liverpool or Leicester? But what I had, what I didn't emphasise, and that's where uh, Mark confused me by saying Sinclair and Turi, is they had to have had Celtic on their CV at the Before. time of playing for Brendan. So Craig Beatty is a correct answer. He was correct with that. But there are two more who've played for Brendan Rodgers at one of those clubs um, who had Celtic on their CV when they linked up with Brendan at said clubs. So I say Sinclair and Toure are not correct answers, contrary to what Mark said. I've had played for Celtic before they were linked up with them. At before any they because clubs. Sinclair and Toure joined up with... They hadn't played at Celtic when they'd played um, under Rodgers at Swansea, in Sinclair's case, and Liverpool with Toure, in his case. So who... There are two others. So they had to have Celtic on their CV... I take a guess here, Phil. We mm -hmm. for some reason Mark thought Fotheringham that name jumps. Did he play with Swansea? It's, it's an interesting shoot, by the way, but it's not him. That's a, not, not bad outside Benk the ball. Benkovic. Benkovic. Benkovic is correct. Yes, Benkovic is indeed because he'd been on loan at Celtic. Then he went back to Leicester, and Brendan Rogers turned off his Leicester manager. So yeah. Benkovic yeah. is correct. Um, was that the one you were saying was a bit of a? Can't, that's the answer. That's a bit of an outside the box think that one. So well done, yeah. David. Well done, mate. Aye. Benkovic. Craig Beatty said he'd played for Celtic by the time Brendan got to Swansea. So the third one 
And again, it's a well-known really, player. Um, I mean, he scored in a cup final for Celtic. He's played for Brendan Rodgers. A cup final. And the teams that he could have been were either Watford, Reading, Swansea, Liverpool, or Leicester. When was he at Swansea? What was the year he was at Swansea again? He was at Swansea from 2010 to 2012. Mm. But it's yeah, not a Swansea one. It's not as good because I can't think of any Swansea players. It's from his play. time at Reading and this player oh. has scored a goal in a cup final for Celtic. Played for Reading? Mm-hmm. I can't say I'm very... Reading would have been the championship at the time, eh? Well, still yeah. are. A defender. And he's Irish. He's Irish and he's a defender. Darren O'Dea. Darren O'Dea. Darren oh, O'Dea had a loan yeah. spell really? at Reading. Yes, indeed. Had a loan spell at Reading under Brendan Rodgers. Um, I see, so that's one of them. Craig Beatty was at Swansea when Brendan turned up as Swansea manager and Philip Benkovic. If you want a wee extra half point, this one kind of counts because he was a youth player at Celtic. Harry Souter was on Celtic's books as a youngster. And, of course, he I turned would, up at Leicester. Aye, would, have him, would have him, by the way. Aye, not bad for him, not bad. He's, he's, uh, player. he's playing for uh, Australia, isn't he? But John obviously just played for... John uh, for Scotland. Aye, but Harry Souter is um when I looked at his career, I was like, Oh, he's got Celtic as a youth career. I didn't know that at all. But I so yeah, the three answers I say are players who were uh, had Celtic on their C V when Brendan became their manager, and it'd be Darren Adi, Craig B A, and Philip Benkovic, who ironically Brendan signed at Celtic and then uh, ended up as his manager at Leicester. Uh so there's your there's your three. I see Harry Souter for a wee extra half point as well, if you want that. So yeah. That um is all for tonight's show. Um, so yeah, going into the weekend, because we are in preseason. Uh, we did think that the shows would have slowed up in the preseason, but no, Celtic have just thrown this grenade in here. We are leaving, Brendan coming back. Shows just getting churned out left, right, and centre. But yeah, Bastal just now back. So obviously next Friday we'll continue on in our uh, Bastalgia tour. I believe I've got a few season ones that I need to get wrapped up as well. No normal. Normal service shall resume. Uh, Sunday, David, there'll be a, a dignified Sunday blader, I assume. Yes, uh, that's the plan anyway. Mm-hmm. As long as there's no sudden changes of the plan, it should Sunday blader should go ahead as normal. So uh, get your alarm clock set for that. <laughs> no worries, no worries at all. I believe as well that at some point me and David are, are planning a little uh, two-man show, a wee pre-recorded thing. Whenever transfers get announced, we'll do a wee two-man sort of transfer show, just talking about the new signing. Once they're official, we're not going to do one speculating because phew, we're churning out shows all, every single day, mate, as a result of that, because we get linked with all sorts of players. But once players are made official, we're going to try and do a wee sort of quick 20-minute videos on the, the player that we're getting and talking about their stats and their career so far. So that's something we've got planned as well. We've kind of missed the boat on old uh, Thiago, Odin Thiago home. He's already in the door. But Just um, watch Mark's five, 30 seconds of, of what he thinks of him. That'll, that'll fill your boots. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> indeed. <the> <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. Um, but yeah, if any other shows pop up, I say there's only one way that you can find out, Humble Viewers, as long as you have hit that subscribe button and you've hit the bell notification, you will be made aware when the Boise bus is on the road. By all means, hop aboard and join us on this adventure. So, yeah, we're out of here for this evening. It's been good to get back to the old nostalgia stuff. So, still, Liam, it's good to see you again, mate. Happy to be on, mate. Enjoy it. I really enjoyed it. It was great. It's first chance to really come on and talk about Brendan since it's been official, official. That's and- right, aye. It's great. It's good. I'm, I'm, I'm with Mark on, on this as well. I'm excited. I think there's some good things going to come. And yes, I'll, indeed. He's a good communicator, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing him talk to the to his fans and keep us up to date on what's happening. I am indeed, uh, indeed. I missed you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Miss you too, mate. I say it's not been the same for the last few weeks, but things have just got in the way. You know, I was like, I don't think people want to hear about Neil Lennon seasons when 
we were looking for a new manager and then there was one week in particular I just couldn't even speak because I was that unwell with a sore throat so yeah there you go but David thank you as well for standing in as well we impromptu substitution there when Mark had to jump off and of course thanks to Mark as well who was on in the first half of the show so yeah it's been a it's been a busy bus tonight but yeah we are off ski folks so enjoy your weekend whatever you get up to and uh yeah, we'll see you back whenever we're next on again. I'm sure it'll be some point of the weekend, so we'll catch you all then, folks. See you later. See you later, guys. Oh.